So good evening, everybody. Uh, we are very happy to have with us uh, for today's 21st Osmoon Lecture. Uh, it will be given by Dr. Indranil Banik. Indranil is currently a research fellow in the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He obtained his master's from the University of Cambridge in 2014 and his PhD from the University of St. Andrews in 2018. He was then a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Bonn before taking up his current position. He has thought a great deal about MOND, modified gravity, and today he will speak to us on strong constraints on weak gravity from Gaia DR3 wide binaries. Over to you, Indranil. So thank you, uh, Tejinder and Michael. Um, so yes, I'll be talking about uh, some constraints we obtained on the behavior of gravity at uh, low gravitational field strengths, or weak gravity, if you will, um, from wide binary stars with separations of two um, up to 30,000 astronomical units, which is uh, approximately 0 0.01 up to 0 0.15 parsec. Um, in case you're wondering why I haven't shown a binary system here, but a, a triple system or a hierarchical system that will become apparent in due course. Um, so yes, this has been published recently in MNRAS. Um, and uh, these are the collaborators. So mainly we relied on inputs from these two researchers at Queen Mary University of London uh, as the observers, because I'm a theorist, um, essentially. So uh, just to give an introduction, um, this is uh, the rotation speed of a galaxy as a function of distance from its center, so the so-called rotation curve of the disk galaxy, new galaxy catalog 6503. So that's observations. The problem is that in Newtonian mechanics, the expectation is that the rotation curve would do something like this, um, which is wrong. Uh, but why is it wrong? Because in the solar system, uh, more distant planets do orbit the sun slower, and most of the galaxy's visible mass is concentrated in this region. So it's very weird why it would look so different. Um, but another way of plotting this data, uh, which doesn't necessarily explain the, the problem, but it, it quantifies in a different way, is the so-called radial acceleration relation, or RAR, diagram where on the y-axis you plot uh, the gravity, in other words, v squared over r, and on the x-axis you plot the Newtonian gravity, um, or equivalently the v Newton squared over r. Um, and of course, the, uh, the data points are a long way above the line of equality. Um, what's interesting is that if you plotted many other galaxies on the same axes, you, you get them all to line up on a very narrow track. So different galaxies, uh, probe different parts of this uh, relation, but there is, seems to be one underlying radial acceleration relation. Uh, by the way, if you try to plot it in other ways, for example, if you just tried to plot 150 rotation curves on the same axes, you would actually be able to distinguish the different galaxies. Whereas here, the different galaxies are not distinguishable um, at all. In fact, you, there would be no real way to know that there was 153 galaxies unless I told you that. Um, the other thing to realize is that the gravitational field strength, uh, where the discrepancies, well, the discrepancy from the line of equality sets in is at about 10 to the minus 10 meters per second squared. Uh, and also the slope here on the log log axis is, is approximately half, whereas at the high acceleration end, um, where g and gn are much the same, obviously this slope is about one. Um, the solar system is at, uh, um, maybe 10 to the 0, 10 to the minus 1 meters per second squared. So um, this uh, acceleration threshold here, below which gravity seems to break down, or perhaps below which dark matter becomes important in galaxies, is about uh, 2,500 times weaker than uh, the gravity, the solar gravity on the Voyager 2 spacecraft, which is kind of as low down as we can directly probe the behavior of gravity. There's no sort of direct laboratory constraints, the behavior of gravity at a lower acceleration than that. Um, so this, uh, of course, um, is going to be very important in a sec. 
because basically white binaries are going to probe the behavior of gravity at a similar acceleration scale around here. Um, so this was for disk galaxies, but in elliptical galaxies, you have much the same radial acceleration relation. So the um, data for spiral galaxies is shown in background in the blue. Uh, darker blue corresponds to sort of more data. Uh, but importantly, these uh, colored dots correspond to elliptical galaxies. It's very hard to distinguish uh, one elliptical galaxy from another on this uh, graph. Uh, if these were all colored black, then you would not be able to say, you know, which of these galaxies each data point came from. You would not be able to identify distinct galaxies from from these data points. Uh, so elliptical galaxies uh, also obey the radial acceleration relation. And you may be wondering, how do we know the rotation speed of an elliptical galaxy? Because it's um, not uh, rotationally supported. And there is this so-called mass anisotropy degeneracy where... Uh, if you um, have a combination of rotation and pressure support, but you don't know exactly what proportion of the support is coming from gravity, uh, fr from rotation, and what proportion from random motions, then it becomes very difficult to know the strength of gravity. Um, there's essentially two ways to break this degeneracy. Either you can have a galaxy which, uh, or a subsystem within a galaxy which is completely pressure supported, that way, there's absolutely no chance any of the support is coming from rotational motion. Or it's a completely rotationally supported system, uh, in which case you don't need to worry about the random motions. Uh, that latter example, obviously, is kind of what we rely on in spiral galaxies, with some slight but not very important corrections for random motions. Um, now, um, and, and these are the two cases which are shown here. Uh, this one is from a pressure support halo of hot gas around the galaxy. Basically, circular motions would quickly lead to collisions between gas parcels uh, and uh, lead to randomization of the motion. So this is a uh, pressure supported system. And uh, this is the small fraction of elliptical galaxies which have an actual thin rotationally supported gas disk, um, kind of like spiral galaxies. But obviously, in the elliptical case, this is a very subdominant fraction of the mass. Still, it can be used to obtain reliable measurements of the gravity against, uh, well, of the of the actual gravity. I think the neutral gravity is slightly easier because we just need to know the distribution of the mass. You don't need to know its kinematics to get that. So we've seen spiral and elliptical galaxies follow the radial acceleration relation. Uh, this leads me on to the idea that what you are seeing is not a uh, coincidence, but is sort of a fundamental aspect of how nature works. Um, and this uh, leads to the so-called Milgromian dynamics or MOND hypothesis, which I uh, have done a very detailed review of um, that you can read here. It's been very popular, apparently, um, mainly, I think, because you can read whichever section of it you want. Uh, pertaining to any particular issue that you're interested in. Um, but uh, the main thing you need to know for that is that uh, in a sort of spherically symmetric system, G, the gravity equals the Newtonian prediction Gn at high accelerations, but at low accelerations, G equals square root of A0 Gn. Um, now, uh, in general, you would say that G equals some interpreting function nu times gn. And uh, in order to achieve a generalization to more complicated geometries, you just take the divergence of both sides. So you get grad dot g equals grad dot nu gn. Nu is an interpolating function which takes as argument the magnitude of the Newtonian gravitational field strength. Um, and this can be derived from a Lagrangian, so it satisfies the usual conservation laws. Um, you can also make a relativistic theory. Relativistic bond theories usually work in a particular way for the weak deflection limit, uh, which I'll explain in a sec. So essentially, you have the same relation as in general relativity between the deflection angle of a photon and the gravitational field felt by non-relativistic test particles. Um, of course, the difference in Mond is that G will be larger, typically, for the same mass distribution. Uh, but um, this relation is the standard one that you also have in GR. And it carries over to, to Mond, or at least one can build Mond theories where it is like that. 
and that's how people have done it for at least 30 odd years because it's necessary. Um, so if you try to then uh, use this relation uh, combined with observations of weak gravitational lensing of background galaxies by foreground galaxies, you can probe the gravitational field. Uh, again, you can plot the Newtonian gravity along the x-axis, and uh, these additional points are the so-called weak lensing area, um, which extends the disk galaxy area down by another five orders of magnitude in Gn, or equivalently two and a half magnitudes in G, because in this limit, G is basically equal to square root of A0 Gn. They're both under the square root. Um, so MON seems to work fairly well, um, but uh, there are uh, problems with certain, uh, well, the, this particular attempt to extend MON uh, fails to match the weak lensing area and also the superfluid dark matter uh, model, which mimics MON in many ways, is, is also ruled out. Uh, mainly because um, whatever extra boost is present in superfluid dark matter to account for disk galaxy rotation curves only applies to baryons. It doesn't apply to photons, um, which is obviously incorrect observationally. You need to boost the gravity on both baryons and photons. Um, so uh, that's um, the weak lensing. Now, we, how do we test what is going on, uh, especially given the galaxies could have dark matter and uh, you can assign an arbitrary distribution which can mimic the observations. So one way to get around this is to use so-called wide binary stars. Uh, wide binary stars are stars separated by a few percent of a parsec or a few thousand astronomical units such that the gravity between the stars in the white binary is less than or comparable to A0, uh, which is 1.2 times 10 to minus 10 meters per second squared. So um, obviously in galaxies, the rotation curve anomalies, the missing gravity problem sets in when the accelerations are below about A0. So interesting question is whether that is also the case for white binary stars. So for the sun, uh, the mon radius is 7 kilo AU, um, which is much smaller than the galaxy. And therefore, um, dark matter wouldn't affect white binary stars, even if the galaxy does have a massive cold dark matter halo. Um, however, um, yeah. however, um, yeah, the other thing to realize is that uh, although is that uh, the typical separations between stars in the solar neighborhood is about one parsec. So it's entirely possible to have a white binary, which is not much affected by other stars. Um, and uh, actually, the nearest star to the sun is in a white binary. So white binaries are not too rare either. Um, now, what you need to do, of course, is uh, you need to, well, uh, because these have a very long orbital period, you only sort of see a snapshot of the system. Just like with a galaxy, you only measure the instantaneous velocities. Um, and because of that, you don't really know about the orbital phase. It's a random orbital phase. Also, um, because we lack all 60 phase space quadrants, you need to do some, yeah, you, you need to allow for projection effects. And therefore, we need to statistically do the so-called wide binary test, um, which is what I'll mainly be focusing on in this talk. Um, the way that works is you need to consider the uh, parameter V tilde, which is the relative velocity uh, between the stars um, within the sky plane. Uh, though you can, if you had the data, you could use a 3D version. But we'll be focusing on using the sky projected relative velocity divided by square root of gm over r. M is the total mass of the binary, R is the projected separation. Um, this is, by the way, the Newtonian circle of velocity of the wide binary, uh, assuming its separation is R sky. Um, uh, now, the important thing is that because 
the, ob the circle of velocity of a system scales with the square root of the gravity. So V tilde is basically a measure of the square root of the um, ratio between the gravity and the Newtonian gravity. Um, so, um, but uh, that's modulated by all the projection orbital phase effects. So that's essentially what we'll be focusing on. Uh, the other thing to understand is um, that MOND enhances the wide binary orbital velocity by 20% uh, in the regime where the separations are larger than the uh, MOND radius. Um, there's also the galactic external field, but that coincidentally happens to be about order A0 as well. So the radius beyond which Y binaries become dominated by the external field and the radius at which they cross the MON radius is about the same um, in the solar neighborhood. The um, Yeah, I'll come on to explaining later on uh, the this important business, uh, which is that the boost to the wide binary orbital velocities, it's 20% boost, is essentially the same uh, percentage that the Newtonian baryonic rotation curve of the Milky Way must be enhanced in order to match the actual rotation curve. Um, so what I mean by that is um, this orange curve is the Newtonian baryonic rotation curve of the Milky Way. Okay, um, that's what the rotation curve would be without dark matter, is even Newtonian gravity. Um, the data points are up here. So you need an extra 25% boost to go from about 180 to about 230 kilometers a second. Um, so, but it, accounting for the some slight complications in one, uh, basically the same enhancement factor should also affect the, the um, orbital velocities of local wide binary stars around each other. Um, so um, that's essentially what I was trying to say. Um, so you can ignore the, the red curve if you wish. Uh, that's another modified gravity theory called Moffat gravity or MOG, which which fails, as you can see. Um, the other th uh, just briefly, I want to mention that if you scale this orange curve up by some factor, that can theoretically pass through this uh, point, of course. But then it it will be declining even more steeply. Um, the gradient will also get multiplied by the same factor, and then it will not match the rotation curve. So basically, there's no way to explain the rotation curve of the Milky Way near the solar circle without either adding a lot of dark matter or boosting the gravity um, law. Um, in other words, having new greater than one in Mond. Um, the new needs to be about 1.5. Right. So. Um, what uh, happened with this uh, wide binary test? Well, um, this is something we've been working on for a long time. Um, this is a plot from the uh, Petoris and Sutherland 2019 paper, where you see uh, the first real V tilde distribution that I'm going to show. That's in red from Gaia DR2. The Mont prediction is in um, pink, but if you do the Mont prediction without the external field effect, in other words, you forget about the gravity imposed by the rest of the galaxy. You get the green prediction, uh, which is completely incorrect. Um, so uh, Mond without the external field effect um, is completely ruled out. Uh, that's OK, because Mond is supposed to have the external field effect. And um, if you do the Mond calculation more rigorously, basically, you'd get the pink distribution which is hard to distinguish from the black distribution, which is the Newtonian case. Um, however, the data don't really follow either because there's some kind of an extended tail uh, going up to much higher V tilde than is possible in kind of any gravity theory, basically. So this is thought to be due to closed binaries, which we expected would be the dominant concern in priori. Um, the declining tail implies it's not due to line of sight contamination. That would cause like a rising tail, which is not observed. Um, at least, uh, well, it, it is observed if you go out much further than is shown on this plot. But basically, um, yeah, it's also not caused by Gaia measurement errors for reason I'll explain later. Um, but basically, it's 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 not due to that. Um, what it is due to almost certainly is the closed binaries, which would create a declining tail, um, but it would go out much further um, 
than the uh, limit of 1.4 in the Newtonian mechanics, so the 1.7 limit in Mond. So uh, I'll, I'll explain in, about closed binaries in more detail, but hopefully that explains why I had a closed binary as part of a wide binary in the first slide of my talk. So um, before we get on to that, I'll explain uh, the, a few basics. Uh, I'll, I'll explain initially how we obtain stellar masses, and then we'll get on to some of the details of closed binary modeling and line of sight contamination. So first of all, I want to mention that uh, the way the wide binary test uh, has been done in the publication mentioned on the first slide is that uh, um, the detailed plan was posted on archive in autumn 2021 in order to mitigate the very severe moral hazards associated with the white binary test. So let's not underestimate the, seri the severity of the moral hazards associated with such a critical test of the gravity law. But I knew about that and I took extreme precautions to mitigate it. Um, so this also shows you how uh, we plan to do the calculations in a computationally efficient manner. Um, but naturally, that requires understanding like what the code will be doing, and therefore, it also explains how we actually handle the problem, uh, and it also includes the, the uh, a, a decision on the parameter ranges to be used, uh, which I'll try and explain later on exactly why we chose it that way. Uh, but suffice to say, these were fixed in advance to mitigate moral hazards. Um, now, regarding the stellar masses, uh, these were obtained, uh, oh, I should say, there are only some very minimal changes were made to this plan, um, and they really don't really affect much. They explained in the paper exactly how we changed it and so on, but very minimal changes were made. So um, regarding the stellar masses, these are obtained from the absolute Gaia-Bad magnitude um, using the Picot and Mamajek 2013 mass luminosity relation. But uh, those authors have updated their data table more recently. So we were using the version from March 2021. Uh, we also applied a correction to the masses obtained in this way uh, based on the relatively modest proportion of the stars in a sample which have a spectroscopic Gaia mass from this so-called flame work package. And that allowed us to sort of adjust the masses slightly uh, and get a more accurate mass um, estimate. Um, the MOND enhancement to gravity is equivalent to, uh, well, that's like a 40, 45% enhancement to gravity, which is uh, equivalent to the same percentage enhancement to the mass. Um, and uh, what you should understand is that that's equivalent to 1.8 uh, magnitudes in the G-band which is obviously quite a lot compared to the tiny scatter we see about the blue polynomial fit to the Picot and Mamajek mass luminosity relation. Uh, that's shown in red and obviously has various sorts of small scale irregularities arising from, uh, you know, the complexities of stellar uh, physics. Um, by the way, we don't use the blue line be below this gray line. Then we use a, a linear relation below that. And also above this gray line, we use a linear relation this shows the highest mass that we actually have in our sample. So it doesn't matter that the our approximation doesn't um, work so well uh, beyond it. There's not very far off. Uh, it's just that you can't use the cubic over the full range, but also a, a purely linear relation wouldn't quite work because this isn't quite straight line. Um, so uh, the other thing, uh, yeah, so I want to say about that is, um, the Picot and Mamajek relation only applies to main sequence stars. So that's the Gaia main sequence, if you like, the Ga Gaia band absolute magnitude against the blue minus red color, or the blue apparent magnitude minus the red apparent magnitude. Um, there's some stars which are like here, which basically are white dwarfs, which you removed. We uh, also removed stars, uh, well, removed white binaries in which either star is in a direction where the um, dust extinction is more than 0.5. Uh, but that's towards an extragalactic source. So the dust extinction towards the white binary, is to, to the, towards the stars in it, is probably much smaller. So this is fairly conservative. Um, dust is not supposed to play a major role for white binaries uh, within 250 parsec. So, uh, you could probably also see these two dashed black lines 
which uh, are a factor of two apart in luminosity, um, there is this sort of parallel main sequence uh, to the, uh, sorry, there's this parallel over density of, of stars to the main sequence. Uh, and that's like a double main sequence, if you will, which is caused by unresolved binaries where the stars have an exactly equal mass. Uh, because they have the exact same mass, they're the same color, but the luminosity is a factor of two larger. Um, they serve as included as part of our, two, of, of our closed binary model, which I will get on to in a sec. So uh, before I talk about the closed binary modeling, um, just how do we get the V tilde of the wide binary? So you probably saw that Pitotis managed to do that like already in the 2019 paper. It's not too hard to get V tilde. Um, basically, uh, there's some slight complications with that, which I will mention, but these don't affect it very much. Um, we um, need for our analysis, the systemic radial velocity because there is a certain perspective effect whereby if the white binary is receding as a whole, even without any relative velocity at all, it'll get smaller on the sky and that will look like a proper motion. Um, but because we only need the systemic radial velocity roughly, um, it's fine if we have the radial velocity for just one of the two stars in the white binary. Um, but uh, so it, it won't matter if the, you think the y binary is receding at 20 kilometers a second is actually 20 and a half or something. This isn't a big deal. But if you implicitly assume that the y binary has a radial velocity of zero, when in reality the whole system is receding at 20 kilometers a second, that can uh, affect the results a little bit. Um, so we waited for DR3 to get around this issue. The other thing is that... Um, you don't really know uh, which star is closer to us or which star is further away because the Gaia trigonometric parallaxes aren't accurate at the kilo AU level. Um, so what we do is we um, infer the, uh, we randomly assign the separation along the line of sight as a ratio to the to the projected separation R sky. This is done assuming uh, R to the minus 1.6 prior because that's basically what the wide binary seem to be following. Um, once we've sort of decided what the separation of the wide binary is along the line of sight, in other words, the difference in the heliocentric distances to the stars in the wide binary, what we do is we move one star towards us by half that amount and the other away from us by half that amount. And obviously, you have to randomly decide which star should be pushed away from us, which star should be towards us. By the way, this is only done if the Gaia trigonometry parallaxes aren't very precise. If they are, um, then we actually directly use the Gaia trigonometric parallaxes. Um, but we're expecting that to only very rarely occur uh, for the distances that we are considering. Um, then when we talk about uh, velocities within the sky plane, what we mean is we try and get the 3D velocities as accurately as possible. And then we project into the sky plane, which is defined as the normal as the plane whose normal is the angle bisector of the directions towards the two stars in the white binary. Um, then we use a full Gaia covariance matrix to propagate uncertainties in the parallax and proper motions. Um, these aren't the only uncertainties that we include, though these are certainly the, especially the proper motion uncertainties as definitely the main uncertainties in the white binary test. But we also allow uncertainties in the apparent magnitude um, the uh, there's all uncertainty in the absolute magnitude is therefore not only from the distance but also from the apparent magnitude. Um, then at fixed absolute magnitude, like even if you did know the absolute magnitude, you wouldn't know the mass exactly. There's like a five and a half percent uncertainty that's based on the difference between the masses uh, that we estimate and the flame masses, which are not available in all cases, but uh. In the case of they are, that's a typical uh, dispersion between the two. And a, a, a priori, we were expecting a 6% uncertainty in the mass at fixed absolute magnitude. And that's stated in the 2018 paper. So this is totally reasonable. Um, now, what uh, we then did is use Monte Carlo trials, use 4096 Monte Carlo trials to quantify the uncertainty in the V tilde parameter for each uh, wide binary. Um, so uh, there are some quality cards that were applied, uh, such as removing low galactic latitudes, regions of known star clusters, 
a few other things you mentioned in the paper. But uh, one of the most important is that the uncertainty in the VTIL parameter should be small. Um, we allow a maximum error of 0 0.1 in the most critical range for the wide binary test, uh, which is to say VTIL the less than 2. And beyond that, uh, we allow maximum error to, to rise slightly. Um, but uh, basically, all the interesting physics should really happen uh, within the region VTIL the less than 2. Um, especially given that the main peak in the distribution is near half. I'll, I'll show some more VTL distributions later. But because the peak is near a half, the, um, an uncertainty of 0.1, which is, by the way, the maximum, the actual uncertainties are smaller, uh, typically. But an uncertainty of 0.1 would uh, inflate the dispersion. The intrinsic dispersion of 0.5 would be inflated to a dispersion of 0.52. Uh, but this is a very small effect compared to the 20% effect we're searching for, um, which means that uh, Gaia errors can be neglected, provided you apply this quality cut, of course. Um, otherwise, you could have systems with a much larger error, and that could cause problems. But if you limit the um, error in this way, um, then it should be fine to neglect measurement errors and just sort of use the nominal values in the Gaia catalog. Um, this graph shows you the uh, distribution of the V tilde uncertainty. So the r uh, red and black curves show the most sort of critical range for the white binary test. And in that range, uh, the V tilde errors are typically a lot smaller than the limit of 0.1 that we've allowed. Um, obviously, the uh, distributions go out further at higher V tilde because we're allowing a larger error. Um, there's also a tendency for the lowest V tilde uncertainty to increase. And, and that's basically because the uncertainty, the five and a half percent uncertainty in the mass imposes the minimum uh, percentage uncertainty in V tilde. So if V tilde is larger, the uncertainty in V tilde is also larger, um, or at least the contribution from the mass uncertainty is larger. And the total is obviously be bigger than, than that one. Um, so that's essentially the, the VTILD uncertainty. So you can see that we should really be able to get some pretty excellent results from Gaia DR3. Um, this is the observed distribution of our sky and VTILD, uh, basically because VTILD is a 2D quantity and so actually is the R sky. Um, there should be sort of a, along the VTILD axis, there should be a linear rise in the distribution and then it should drop off. Uh, what, um, this is a genuine wide binaries, that's that's correct, but also it's true for the closed binaries. I'll explain why later on, but the closed binaries should also create a declining trend. Um, if you go up to very high V tilde, there should be a, a rise eventually because of uh, line of sight contamination. So this is systems which is aligned on the sky, but they're not actually close by in 3D. Uh, this will... Um, eventually uh, cause the distribution to pick up. But um, nonetheless, there will be a minimum in the distribution be just beyond the main peak of the VTL distribution. So so this is the main peak at about a half, as I was saying. Then it drops off, and there's like a minimum here. Um, that's also the case at larger R sky. But because the total number of systems at larger R sky is smaller, uh, that leads to these pixels being completely empty, whereas here they still had kind of a handful of systems. So here um, you end up with a gap in the distribution, which sort of widens, so like uh, that. Um, so that's kind of uh, reasonably well understood why that would be. Um, so that that's the is uh, what we call in the plan the observed um, photograph or distribution of our sky and V tilde. The pixels here are the ones that we decided on in the plan. Uh, we found that 86, 11 systems passed the quality cuts uh, that we implemented, um, including various things such as each star appearing as a single Gaia source in at least 98% uh, of the focal plane transits. Um, if it appears as multiple sources, there's a chance it's actually an unresolved closed binary. And we try to um, avoid closed binaries if we can. Then we also model the remaining population of closed binaries. Um, so our, our approach is, is twofold, if you will. Um, I'll come on to the closed binaries in a sec. Um, but before I do that, I want to explain just how 
sensitive these uh, white binaries actually are to MOND. Um, so for that, what I've plotted on the y-axis is the um, ratio between the radial, the inward gravity and the Newtonian gravity. These angle brackets denote angular averaging because if you change the orientation of a white binary relative to the external field, that changes the um, strength of the gravity a little bit. So we've uh, considered an angle average here. Um, what we've uh, done then is plotted this eta as a function of the radius divided by the mon radius. So this actually applies to all wide binaries in the solar neighborhood, not for any particular mass, but if the mass was larger, the mon radius would be larger. Um, so this black curve shows the main result that we are using in the paper. The red line shows the asymptotic result uh, for sort of large separations in uh, QMON, which is what we're exploring. So you can see the numerical results nicely uh, fall on the red line at, at large separations. Um, this uh, blue line uh, is the asymptotic aqual result, but it's been worked out in a way. Uh, yes, so that, that's the asymptotic aqual result. Um, this um, blue line is the uh, numerical uh, aqual result. Um, uh, but uh, it's um, the data mainly uh, are in from this regime. Um, so you can see it follows the black curve very nicely. And uh, the differences between Aqual and Cubon, which are two different ways of formulating the Mond equation, are very, very similar. Um, so, um, yeah, the other important thing is the distribution of uh, wide binaries in our sample, which is shown in red. So the way this is done, um, the leftmost edge of the leftmost bin is the minimum value in our sample. The same at the right. Um, but you can see that our sample go nicely goes down to about 0.2 mon radii. In other words, um, we cover accelerations up to about 25 A0, which should be more, uh, more than sufficient for the purpose of the wide binary test, because obviously the mon effects are supposed to be very small by the time you get uh, this close in. Um, we also go quite far out. Uh, so basically this rising portion of the black curve and to some extent even this flat region here we're able to probe very nicely with many thousands of wide binaries um therefore um wide binaries uh the, the sample of wide binaries we have should be not only very high quality but also ideal for the purpose of testing mod um both in terms of the dynamic range uh in the crucial parameter, which is the ratio between the radius and the mon radius, and the uh, also in terms of the quantity or the sample size. Um, so one slight technical thing, uh, obviously, the um, we don't know the full 3D separation, relative separation of the stars in a wide binary. So these red bars are plotted based on the sky projected separation. Uh, but uh, the actual separation should not be much larger. It, it should typically be only sort of 20, 30 percent larger, maybe, um, because if you have three directions, when you're only observing two, then you'd expect a ratio of square root of three over two, which is about 1.2. So um, this is uh, the, um, yeah, the this is um, the attraction, if you will, of wide binaries in Mond. Not only in terms of the gravitational field between them, but also like why it's such an attractive project to do. Um, now, if we uh, try and get some preliminary results finally, then what um, I'm going to show here is the uh, median V tilde as a function of the uh, ratio R sky over RM. RM is a mod radius and R sky is a projected separation. I'm just going to make 10 bins in this uh, ratio with equal sample size. Um, what would happen is that the median is supposed to rise uh, due to mod uh, but importantly, we need to focus on the main peak region at V tilde less than two, approximately. Um, the reason is that um, uh, you shouldn't really have wide binaries beyond about square root of two in Newtonian gravity, which would be 1.7 in Mond because of the extra gravity. But um, beyond that, you are just pick up contamination of various sorts. So we've argued that it could be due to closed binaries, but it could also be due to line of sight contamination which definitely is more important to at large separations and therefore 
at lower accelerations, right? And that can lead to a fake MOND signal because you could have large separations where um, line of sight contamination in inflates your median V tilde, and that looks like a MOND signal then. But uh, you can avoid such problems relatively easily by just focusing on the main peak region at V tilde less than two, uh, approximately. So this is why we've considered 1.52 and 2.5 thresholds. So what happens if you do all that? Um, the answer is shown here. So you've got the median V tilde against the median R sky by RM in 10 different bins. Um, now, uh, what should happen in MON is there should be a 20% rise uh, between uh, approximately 0.2, which is um, essentially sufficiently low that it is just Newtonian at this point, um, and one uh, where you kind of, where the MON effect saturates. Um, after this 20% rise, uh, there should be a flat line, uh, which is what obviously, yeah, we've shown here. Um, now, the important reason I have shown two gray lines is because the normalization is arbitrary, uh, as in you can predict it in detail based on a model, but um, we're not doing that here. This is just a model independent way of looking at the data. What we, um, what happens, of course, is that the exact details of the distribution of orbital eccentricities and projection effects and other things uh, can change the median V tilde of your sample. Um, and that's reg true regardless of the gravity law. So for example, uh, I have not tried to explain why exactly the data is at 0.57 at, in the Newtonian regime. What, all I've done in this graph is say that, okay, let's assume there's some physics which causes it to be 0.57 in the Newtonian regime. Then in MOND, uh, those effects, like the projection effects, for example, should stay the same. They should work the same way. And therefore, because the orbital velocities should be 20% larger than the Newtonian expectation, the V tilde should be 20% higher, and then it should continue going flat. Remember that um, the um, change of the Newtonian circular velocity with the projected separation is something that we've already accounted for by using the V tilde parameter rather than actual velocities in meters per second. Um, so, yeah, what should happen is something like the gray line, but um, you can multiply it by some arbitrary factor. As in, instead of starting at 0.57, you could start at 0.61, though you'd still have to have a 20% rise by the time you get up to here, and then it would still have to go flat. So the overall sort of shape, if you will, is the same, but you can multiply the gray shape by some factor, if you like. Um, in the Newtonian case, of course, the median V tilde should be flat with respect to R sky over RM. Um, which is actually much, much closer to what the data shows. Uh, and therefore, there is clearly a very strong preference for the Newtonian model. So this is our first strong hint um, that uh, MOND might not work in the end. Um, you can also see, by the way, that for the V tilde less than 5, which is the maximum V tilde in our sample. So if you just show the full sample, you get this pink, uh, which kind of looks vaguely like MOND. But um, if that was a real MON effect, then it would have to arise from a broadening in the main peak of the distribution. And therefore, limiting your V tilde range to V tilde less than two and a half or two, you should still have seen the signal. You shouldn't have been able to eliminate it just by removing systems with V tilde greater than 2.5. Because this with V tilde greater than 2.5 are obviously some sort of contamination. Um, so um, that shows how careful one has to be when doing the white binary test. But basically, this is a very simple model independent way of looking at the data. And if you had seen something like the gray curve uh, using a V tilde upper limit of two, or better yet, of 1.5, because with projection effects, there should really be almost no white binaries beyond 1.5, even in MOND. Um, so if you'd seen something like, like the gray curve, then that would have been a sign of MOND, but that's not what we see. Um, so uh, how do we model this and basically how do we try and understand why it is 0.57 rather than just treating that as a as an arbitrary parameter uh, that somehow arose? Um, well, you'd have to, in, well, in the Newtonian case, it's relatively simple because you integrate the orbit. Uh, so in MON, you'd have to find the gravitational field first, which we do by assuming there's like one point mass with a fixed external field effect. Um, we're treating the white binary as a single mass plus a test particle. So um, basically treating the 
approximating that the mutual or relative motion, the relative dynamics is the same, uh, regardless of the mass ratio of the wide bind. It only depends on the total mass. This approximation is well known to work in the Newtonian case, but uh, I've explained previously in this paper why it, it's a very good approximation also in, in Mohr, essentially because of the external field dominated regime, uh, this is also like an exactly correct thing that you can superpose the gravitational fields of the two stars. So we, we consider 20 revolutions, we consider dense 2D grid of viewing angles, uh, uh, we find out the distribution of uh, R sky and V tilde. Um, we've shown results for a few different eccentricity distributions here. Uh, so, but importantly, all the red curves are, are Newtonian and all the blue curves are Milgromian. Um, clearly, um, it, it's you know, possible to distinguish the two, uh, regardless of the eccentricity distribution of the white binaries. There is clear water between the model predictions. Um, and uh, the form of the tail is not much affected by the eccentricity distribution of the white binaries. Um, the, the, the main reason is that if you had a very eccentric orbit, you could push slightly further out maybe, but it's very unlikely you would see a very eccentric orbit close to pericenter, which is where you need to be to have high V tilde. Um, so uh, what we do in our uh, analysis is interpolate between the Newtonian and Mon predictions using the parameter alpha grab, which we allow to be between minus 2 and plus 3.6. But importantly, the cases 0 and 1 are most important for us. Um, 0 is Newtonian and 1 is uh, Milgromian. So um, finally, we get on to the importance of uh, closed binaries. Um, so what uh, happened here um yeah so we uh, i've already explained why closed binaries are kind of important uh what we've done um uh, so I, i'll explain uh, in in a bit more detail like how we've model model the closed binaries the, one of the main parameters is the fcb which is a likelihood of a star having an undetected closed binary companion um so uh, you have to allow for two major effects from closed binaries. First of all, we're assuming the closed binary is unresolved, basically because if it was resolved spatially, then we would have removed that system from our sample because um, you, you could see the third star in the system. So if it's unresolved, then it, there'll be extra light from the undetected star. Uh, but because of the very steep mass luminosity relation, that extra light will only inflate the estimated mass by a little bit. Um, not as much as the actual mass in the so in the undetected, if you will, companion. CBs, uh, closed binaries, therefore introduce hidden mass, and they also, of course, cause recoil velocity of the um, contaminated star. Uh, but the important thing there is the relative velocity between the photocenter and the barycenter. Uh, the barycenter, of course, is what's important in how much the effect of that system is on the other star in the white binary. Um, and the photocenter is what you see. Um, this vanishes for an exactly equal mass closed binary. Um, so this FCB, which is proportional to the, I mean, that's basically governed by the recoil velocity, uh, the impact on the Y binary V tilde. Um, this black curve therefore peaks somewhere in the middle and drops down again, uh, while, while the red curves, which are related to the hidden mass, that they go up uh, more or less continuously. Um, so, the, yeah, but mainly the thing to understand is that these two effects uh, we need to consider. Uh, hidden mass will, of course, inflate the Newtonian circle of velocity of the white binary, uh, and therefore, you know, it'll kind of inflate the, the V tilde, if, if you will, if your V tilde is calculated assuming the estimated mass, which is too low. Um, so, uh, the Closed binary, uh, so I won't bore you with all the details of the how exactly you model the closed binaries, but suffice to say, we assume some mass ratio distribution, uh, which is based on something that fits the wide binaries very well. So in the wide binaries, of course, we know the mass ratio between the two stars. And I assume that it's similar for the closed binaries. Uh, we allow, um, so what we do is we assume some ratio of A, closed binary divided by a wide binary, uh, we assume it has some maximum value. 
and we allow a 1.5 dex range in the para in this ratio um the thing is we're expecting the, the, the reason why we're allowing a 1.5 dex range is because we're expecting a range from about 3 au to about 100 au um this is based on the angular resolution and this is of the gaia and this is based on the observing baseline of gaia is in the amount of time it's been observing for this uh means that we're expecting the kcb parameter to be about 100 au divided by about 40000 au which is basically what we get uh though in our analysis we didn't impose this as a prior we just asked for kcb to be somewhere between 0.001 and 0.75. Um, so we, you can make some slight changes to the distribution of the closed binary, say major axis, and it, it doesn't really affect the results much. Um, then there's the line of sight contamination, which is the um, well, that, that's fairly clear what that what that means. Uh, the thing is, um, since both the separation and the relative velocity are 2D quantities, you would get a linear distribution in the magnitude of each one. So in other words, the number counts of line of sight alignments, or chance alignments with respect to R sky and V sky would be proportional to both of them. Right. So you can imagine a diagram like this where V tilde is a 2D vector and you're talking about the magnitude of the vector. So it'll be sort of these thin concentric shells whose area is proportional to the radius times the width of the shell. Um, the, uh, there's something similar for R sky. Uh, but uh, if you uh, bear in mind that the v sky is proportional to one over square root of r sky at fixed v tilde, um, or equivalently v sky is proportional to v tilde over square root of r sky, then um, the r sky dependence cancels out, and you just get a v tilde dependence. Um, but the main thing is we can fit that distribution to the data and try and infer it, um, the LOS contamination fraction. So uh, what we've got then um, is the um model uh finally we're in a position to build up the model um the blue curve shows the white binaries only the and the red curve shows what happens if you add closed binaries the the black curve shows the effect of adding line of sight contamination the uh, model shown here is the best fitting mod model uh so the line of sight contamination fraction is, is not very high and it doesn't affect things that much it has a little bit of an effect here but the main thing is the closed binaries obviously reduce the amplitude of the peak a lot and they broaden the distribution and they kind of um, help us to explain the tail that you saw in the observations. Um, so uh, eventually line of sight contamination would cause the distribution to start rising, which happens in some other studies, but not in the parameter range we consider. Um, so uh, these then are the model parameters. There's the gravity law. Um, there's a couple of parameters associated with the um, semi major axis distribution of the white binaries. Uh, so it's a broken, so it's a double power law with the break radius and A break and a high end slope of beta. Sorry, this should say the, the low end slope is fixed to A to the minus 1.6. Um, the uh, eccentricity distribution is parameterized using gamma, which is defined like this. So it's a power law going as E to the gamma. Closed binaries, uh, I've already explained there's these two parameters, uh, so the li likelihood of closed binary companions and maximum ratio of same major axes, the line of sight contamination fraction. So how do we actually get to the um, statistical analysis? Well, first of all, we use a graded ascent to get to the most likely model. Then we, um, and that's based on binomial statistics at the pixel level um, in log space. Uh, and then uh, after we do the grain test and we use the MCMC. Um, so uh, this is a very complicated uh, algorithm, but we were eventually able to get it down to a marginal cost of two seconds for each MCMC uh, iteration. So uh, what uh, did we actually find from all this? Uh, so is it okay if I take about another 15 minutes or so? 15 should be okay, yes. Yeah. Um, thanks. So um, I'll show the um, results that we got from all this. So uh, first of all, with the gradient ascent, we got a very strong preference for the Newtonian model by a factor of each to the 175. Um, this shows the distribution of V tilde in different R-sky intervals. 
the black is the Newtonian model, the blue is the mod model, and um, the observations are in red. Um, there is a, a very severe problem with the mod model. Uh, the, the, what has happened is this, um, the declining tail, uh, there's a fairly rapidly declining tail over the range of about 1 to 1 1.5, which uh, importantly looks much the same in different R sky bins. That's not how it's supposed to work in MON because the um, uh, the whole point is that the V tilde distribution basically widens by 20% from low separations, which are like Newtonian, to high separations, which are supposed to be sort of in this asymptotic regime with an extra 20% enhancement. So that's the first sign that, uh, you know, if, from the, our statistical analysis that MON is in trouble. Um, and we explain this by um, changing the closed binary fraction with the same major axis. Uh, this is extremely unlikely. So we quantified this so-called p tail, which is the likelihood that v tilde are greater than 1.5 if we know v tilde is less than 2.5. Um, basically, this is the, the range between 1.5 and 2.5 is where CB's uh, closed binaries are dominant because closer in, white binaries are dominant. And um, further out, line of sight contamination might be important. So, if we quantify this p tail uh, using simple binomial statistics, so using the number counts in this manner, then you get p tail and its uncertainty uh, in four, which we've done in the same four different R sky bins we had earlier. There's no uh, trend, so um, it's very unlikely that significant trends in this will somehow precisely cancel out the mod effects. Doesn't make too much sense. Um, what about changing the eccentricity distribution? So, um, in order to cancel out the Mond effect, you would need gamma to go from about one to about five, which is like a very drastic change. Importantly, you can work out the eccentricity distribution from the angle between R sky and V sky. This is something we haven't used in our paper, but you can use the angle between them because they're both 2D vectors in the sky plane in order to get a constraint on gamma or what these authors have called alpha. Um, and um, if you do that, you get results which look like this. A wide binary sample basically covers this range. The idea that uh, gamma somehow magically shoots up from 1.3 to about sort of 5 in just this range of separations is drastically uh, incompatible with the observations, unfortunately. So um, the... Um, Nominal analysis, uh, which is shown in red here, looks like this. The important thing is that um, the gravity law parameter is extremely close to Newtonian, but it rules out mod at 16 sigma confidence. Uh, this gamma parameter, which we've allowed to be free around in our main analysis, in the revised one shown in blue, we uh, use a prior of this, uh, which is based on Huang et al. 2022, um, you can see that it obviously it, it changes the distribution and significantly tightens the inference on gamma, but uh, the other model parameters, including the gravity law, are barely affected by the um, change. Uh, so, um, in fact, uh, we've considered a large number of changes to the uh, model assumptions, and in all cases, the alpha graph is extremely close to zero. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, there is really no way that this, this mod model could have been correct, unfortunately. Um, which, uh, the one which kind of came close, so if you see here, the one which kind of came closest to, to bond was perhaps this model, where we've halved the likelihood of closed binary complaints from the nominal 63% to 30%. We, we forced it to be fixed to 30%. The inferred gravity law rose a little bit, uh, but it's still very, very far from Mond, and it's only three sigma from the Newtonian case. Uh, and more worryingly, the overall fit to the data, so black is a nominal model, and blue is this revised model with much reduced closed binary contamination, um, which uh, might not look too bad here, but uh, it, it's, the, it's only being able to fit the tail reasonably decently with a much higher line of sight contamination fraction which may kind of look, work here and here, but uh, here it causes drastic disagreement with the observations, uh, leading to a, a poorer fit than the nominal uh, model by 29 sigma. 
so or a, dif- a log likelihood difference of about 500 uh, plus um so that's unfortunately uh, the, the situation so um if i just explain then um why you can't reconcile the white binary test with mon just by changing the interpreting function um the answer is that uh, so basically the white binary test is a constraint of the alpha graph which is less than 0.2 but quite high confidence for the white binary test uh, by definition in qmon uh, with the simple interpreting function alpha graph should be one uh, with the so called mls function that fits rotation curves really well I'll come on to in a bit it should be a bit less with the standard function, this achieves a much sharper transition between the Newtonian and Mond regimes. You might think, well, hang on, that fits the wide binary data. Um, and the answer is that more or less uh, marginally fits. But importantly, what you should look at is the graph on the right, where we've shown the radial acceleration relation from disk galaxies. What's shown in particular is the Newtonian gravity on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, the ratio between the predicted g according to some particular interpreting function and the observed g so obviously ideally what should happen is the data should fall on a horizontal line at zero that should happen with a good model and indeed with the black and blue models which correspond to the simple and mls functions is more or less what happens we omitted the error bars in the blue model but they're basically the same on all models right because the errors come purely from the geobs um so with the standard interpreting function, you get the red curve. The standard interpreting function, remember, works all right with the white binary test, but it leads to drastic disagreement with the radial acceleration relation from rotation curves. So essentially, it, it is completely incompatible with the spark sample of rotation curves. It's also incompatible with the rotation curve of the Milky Way, which formally is an independent constraint because that's not included in spark. Um, the white binary test is basically a measure of what gravity is doing at this value of gn and you can see that um it's basically forcing you to have a point which is somewhere around here uh the um if you had an infinitely sharp transition between the neutron and mon regimes that would be the green curve and that would actually fit the wide binary data almost perfectly but it would lead to drastic disagreement with the rotation curves of disk galaxies um so uh just uh in the last 10 uh, or so minutes i'll explain a couple of uh, additional issues uh, that I think are important. So one thing is um, we've been talking about uh, the wide binary test because essentially every star should have, if you like, a halo of phantom dark matter around it in Mond, which should increase the gravity it exerts on another star. So what I mean by that is this is the uh, Q-Mon field equation. We can think of the Mond gravity source by the baryons as the neutron gravity sourced by something and by definition that's always possible that something is the baryons plus phantom dark matter so this is a purely mathematical trick it will help us visualize the problem a little bit so um the thing to understand is that this interpreting function mu can approach one exponentially fast at high gn so the rotation curve constraints only go up to gn of about 10 maybe 30 a naught but not really much beyond so if you have an exponential approach to one at high accelerations, you, you might think, first of all, that won't cause any problems with rotation curves, but you might think that would exponentially suppress bond effects in the solar system, but it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because uh, this is the phantom dark matter distribution around the sun, including the galactic external field. Uh, you might notice it is slightly asymmetric. There's a bit more here, which isn't there here. Um, this leads to an anomalous divergence-free tidal stress on the inner solar system. So what I mean by that is that the potential of the uh, within this sort of blue region, which might look like a neutronian bubble, and it is at pretty high precision, right? But the um, potential, uh, apart from a constant boost, the the change to the potential is given by this. So Q2 is the extra parameter. R is the position relative to the sun. G hat E is a unit vector towards the galactic center, and uh, delta I G is a conical delta. So this is a, a t- divergence-free tidal stress. Um, the important thing is that it's sort of aligned with the galactic center direction, and it has a magnitude Q2. So basically, it's like if you had a planet up here, it would pull the solar system apart along the z-axis, and it would 
squash it in the orthogonal directions. So it's like that. But what's the magnitude of Q2? Um, and the answer is that it depends when you talk about mond or reality. Because in the real world, um, Q2 is constrained by precise radio tracking of the Cassini orbit around Saturn to 3 plus or minus 3 times 10 to minus 27 per second squared. So remember, Q2 is a tidal stress, so it's gravity divided by distance, and therefore the units are inverse second squared. Um, the mon prediction in, uh, is 27 times 10 to the minus 27 per second squared. Uh, even though we are using an interpreting function, which is exponentially truncated at high accelerations. Now, you can reduce the Q2 with a different interpreting function, just like the white binary test. But then it will no longer be consistent with rotation curve constraints. The reason is the amount of phantom dark matter here depends on the value of the mon interpreting function and the gravity corresponding to the galactic gravity of the solar neighborhood. And we've already seen that a significant enhancement is needed there. So, in short, uh, the impact of mond, uh, sorry, the impact of the Cassini data on mond is kind of like this. Um, that's basically um, a nice illustration of uh, what Cassini has done for mond. Um, this is just a reminder that uh, if the problem is that you need to boost the gravity by about 25 percent. Sorry, the gravity by about 50, 55 percent, and the rotation speed by about 25 percent at the solar circle of the Milky Way. So you can't just say that uh, the intermediate function is so sharp that uh, there is no phantom dark matter around the sun because of the galactic external field. Um, this, unfortunately, would not work. Um, so what about the, uh, yeah, in the last five or so minutes, I'll explain briefly what happened with Shea's claim to have confirmed more than 10 signal confidence. So if you plot the median V tilde against the median R sky by RM, there is a clear signal which looks very much like mod. And by the way, it's easy to argue something like a flat line can't fit the data at 10 signal confidence. That may well be correct. Um, but, the, uh, well, I'll get on to what the problem is in a sec. The main thing to bear in mind here is that um, there is a cut of 1% on the accuracy of the heliocentric proper motion of each star in each white binary on the left and 0.3% on the right. Um, but uh, that's not really the relevant parameter for the white binary test. What you would need to do for that, of course, is to get the relative velocity. And you would need to divide that by the Newtonian VC. This ratio is basically proportional to square root of G over GN. Uh, and I say proportional to because the exact details will depend on the eccentricity distribution, the projection effects and other things. But you can then look for trends in this uh, with the acceleration, which is kind of what we're doing here. And uh, you can see the trend. So you might think that bond is indeed confirmed at 10 signal confidence if you were using Che's sample rather than my one. But what is the difference between our samples? Um, and the answer is the accuracy of the uh, um, tilde uh, measurement. If you, uh, well, as a first step, what we did is we found out like what fraction of white binaries in Che's nominal sample actually have a V tilde that's too uncertain according to our criteria. And we estimated the V tilde error in a much simpler way, but it should capture the essence of the problem. Um, and what we found is that uh, in the Newtonian regime, most of the systems are, should be fine. But in the uh, Mond regime, a lot of the systems that Che included in his analysis should actually have been discarded. If you actually discard them, you end up with a graph which looks like this. In other words, there's a flat line. The mod signal is completely removed. This is not because we've removed like the vast majority of chase sample. We've only reduced the sample size by about 20%. But uh, you can see that, um, and, and all these points have an equal number of white binaries per bin. So you can see that we have uh, indeed data going up to quite far into the asymptotic regime, but the, there is no sign of mod. Um, obviously, the data doesn't look like this gray line. So that should be fairly clear. So um, uh, then, uh, in, in the last few minutes, I'll talk about like some of the broader implications. Uh, wait, just a sec. Uh, yeah. Uh, so um, the, you you can think of Mond as uh, sorry the wide binary test is implying some kind of limit on the density of the phantom dark matter. Uh, basically. Um, 
So we've discussed this in more detail in the paper, but essentially uh, the wide binary test would kind of imply that MOND effects are suppressed uh, in systems with a mass up to about 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, maybe solar masses. Now, if you actually try and look at the where the galaxy data go down to, interestingly, you kind of just about reach that regime. So galactic scale tests cover down to 10 to the 6 solar masses. Uh, in, so the just below that, you'd have like massive globular clusters. And you see 2419 is kind of in trouble with MOND. Um, and that's just below his threshold. So it, it looks like MON kind of breaks down in systems below 10 to the 6 solar masses, perhaps. Um, and that's kind of, kind of what the observations imply, but also what the white binary test would perhaps imply if you interpret it as a limit on the phantom dark matter density. Um, but uh, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, in the last sort of uh, four or five minutes uh, is the... Um, this galaxy radial acceleration relation is not fundamental to realized uh, non-relativistic systems, um, which are also decoupled from the cosmic expansion. Uh, uh, and by that, I mean that it doesn't work in galaxy clusters. So first of all, um, MON does work pretty well in pressure-supported systems like elliptical galaxies and dwarf spheroidals. Uh, it's well known that it predicts too little gravity in galaxy clusters, um, which is also true in for GR. In both cases, you can rectify the gravity theory by, or you can pretend the gravity theory is okay, uh, or you can save it by adding dark matter. That applies to MON, but also to GR. Um, in fact, there's even more dark matter is required in GR. So certainly I'm not going to sit here and say that um, because MON doesn't predict enough gravity in galaxy clusters, it's incorrect because by that argument, general relativity would be even more incorrect. But um, recent data extends to the low acceleration outskirts of galaxy clusters. So low accelerations, uh, large distances would be on the left in this plot. Um, this is a standard uh, radial acceleration relation diagram, but additional data has been added from galaxy clusters, which are these black points with error bars. The important thing to understand here, so you've seen uh, the line of equality before and the MON sort of line in red before. These points are uh, sort of in the background are all galaxies, which given the uncertainties are all nicely consistent with being exactly on this red curve. Um, but the galaxy cluster points are higher up. Now uh, you might think, well, hang on, if we add a bit of dark matter, we can get the points up here. By the way, there's many other studies which nicely trace this region. This study focused on the low acceleration end, which is particularly critical and novel. Here, you can see that the data kind of fall uh, below the red line of the MON prediction, which completely uh, undermines the I idea of MON because you would need to add negative mass to get below the red line. Um, what is more remarkable, the data are very nicely on this dot blue line, which is parallel to the line of equality, but offset up by 0.8 dex or factor of six. So G equals six GN is the blue line. Um, that's the prediction of lambda CDM because uh, galaxy clusters should basically be a microcosm of the whole universe. And uh, based on the CMB and many other constraints, the universe should have five times as much dark matter as visible matter. And therefore, the gravity should be six times as much as the GN. Uh, GN um, refers to the variance. So I'll take questions in only a little while. So, um, so that's the galaxy cluster RAR. Um, and... Uh, that was the study of Lee et al. 2023, which used uh, which used the dynamics of galaxies in the outskirts. So they used galaxies as traces of the potential. Eckert et al. used um, gas, so hydrostatic equilibrium of the gas as the tracer of the potential instead. And they get basically similar results. Um, they also show results closer to the center. Obviously, if you get very close to the center of the cluster, G will approach GN because the baryons can contract more than the dark matter, eventually in the baryon dominated region. But if you worry about the outskirts, the data consistently go below the MON prediction, assuming baryons only. Remember, for the MON to have any chance of fitting this data, there would need to be a lot of dark matter. And uh, therefore, the MON prediction would really not be like this line. It would be some kind of line like here. And um, oh, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you, Indranin. Do you think we could open up for the discussion now? Because... Uh, yeah, just another like two, three minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Sure.
So uh, this is one more of the last slides before I show the conclusion. Um, so uh, what I was going to say is that uh, in a more general way of thinking about this is that uh, the slope uh, on log log axis of G against Gn should have been half at low accelerations in MON. Uh, whereas it should be one in Newtonian gravity, but the normalization could be high if there's dark matter. Um, clearly, the observations strongly prefer a slope of one, if not slightly higher even. Um, so this is a very serious problem for MON in the low acceleration outskirts of the galaxy clusters. Now, seeing as you all want me to get to the conclusion, that's what I'll do. Um, so basically, um, local wide binaries should orbit 20% faster than the Newtonian expectation in MON uh, if their separations are larger or approximately equal to their MON radius, which would be several thousand astronomical units or um, about 3-4% of a parsec, depending on, exactly on the, depending on the exact mass. This prediction is falsified at very high confidence, similar to uh, this paper. Um, the, um, you can't reconcile MON with the wide binary test uh, because of constraints on the form of the interpreting function from galaxy rotation curves, including our own. Um, Monda's modified inertia has been argued to not be compatible with the observations uh, by the person who was speaking last week. Um, the, one can add a new fundamental constant beyond A0 to try and fix this problem. So perhaps a new uh, maximum on the phantom dark matter. So the phantom dark matter is not supposed to be a real thing in Mond, of course, but anyway, one can try and do that. This won't obviously cause any problems with galaxy dynamics, uh, even down to the lowest mass dwarfs, uh, because there's still a lot more massive than a white binary, of course. Um, however, there are very serious problems with the mod model. So this is just an illustration of um, mod being, uh, the mod balloon being uh, attacked by uh, a trident consisting of three prongs, the white binaries, the solar system ephemerides, and the um, galaxy clusters, but the data from the outskirts, I mean, not the data from the inner regions, which can be fixed by adding dark matter, but the data from the outer regions, which can only be fixed by adding negative mass in, in, in a MON context. Um, so uh, that's uh, all from me. Um, I'll be happy to uh, take questions now. Yeah. Thank you very much, Indranil, for this exciting presentation, which we open up for discussions. So uh, we'll soon uh, I'll go over to the people who have uh, raised their hands. In the meanwhile, uh, as we know, we are very interested uh, in understanding why Che and Hernandez get results different from Barnick et al. So at some stage after Anthony and Latham, I don't think Che is here today, but I think Xavier Hernandez is in the audience. I request him to take part in a discussion with Indranil so that we try to understand if we can reach a consensus or understand why you the two groups are getting different results. So, Anthony, over to you, please. Okay, thanks very much for the talk. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Um, perhaps we could go to slide 25. That had some things on it which I, I didn't understand. So, in slide 25, these are results okay i yeah. believe and we can see in the uh the range two to three kau that uh, there's a clear preference for newtonian it's not so clear in the three to five uh range and then by the time we get to five to twelve it actually seems to re reverse and we appear to have a clear preference for the data for mond and then we go out a bit further and uh, again, it's a bit unclear, but you're saying overall, you they it favors Mond by 19 sigma. That, uh, yeah, if you work out the log that? likelihood. How's um, that? So um, we did look at this in the paper in some detail, like splitting into different R sky ranges and seeing the preference for each theory. Interestingly, in this range, it, it does. Uh, if you don't look at any particular detail, where you look at all the we tell the pixels in this range of our sky, it does actually prefer um, the Newtonian model. Uh, and the the reason is, uh, I think, to, because the Arabaza are relatively large around the peak. Uh, the Arabaza are much smaller here. 
and this tail is better fit in Mond. Um, the, um, so I, I think that's, uh, one thing. The other thing is that, uh, there is, of course, like a very significant difference in the model likelihoods from here. And it, um, it's not essentially not possible to compensate for that just because there's a handful of pixels here where the Newtonian model fit better. Um, that's essentially the, the thing. Uh, here in this range of our sky, yes, the mod model is preferred, uh, but not by very much, uh, because, um, still like basically before the peak, the, um, mod model worked better, right? Uh, but after the peak, the neutronium model actually works a bit better. So even here, the, it is pre preferring mod, but not by much. And here it is actually preferring the neutronium model. Um, not in these pixels, of course, but uh, overall in this range of our sky. Um, so if, yeah. if you worked out the total... Well, I mean, I'm, I'm used to doing cosmology by eye, where you look at graphs and you, you hope that they tell you something pretty evidently to the eye. It says, you know, real information there. And I can see that in the first range, two to three, there's a clear, you know, uh, preference for Newton. The others, yeah. either there's no clear preference, or it actually fairly clearly preferences Mond. So, so I'm it does very, very surprised. So, um, I would say uh, th this is only one way of looking at the data. The, uh, you can yeah. also look at it um, you, in this... Wait, where did it go? Um, you can also look at it in this way. Um, Yes, you can also look at it in this way, which is, I think, a bit simpler and much less dependent on the model. Because obviously the curves you're seeing there, are they involve a particular model. Here, it, they don't really rely on a model. Um, it's just the median V tilde in different bins of the ASCII bar RM. All these things can be calculated very straightforwardly from the observations without making assumptions about like how common closed binaries are and so on. Yeah, but you're doing a cut on the quality of V tilde and There's a cut on the error in VTIL, yes. Yes, yes. And and that gets worse as you go to high R sky. And so preferential. No, hang on. Why would that get worse as you get to no, higher in, R sky? Indra, Indra Neil, kindly, if you let, uh, let, uh, okay, uh, go ahead. let uh, Anthony speak. And then, of course, you respond, yeah. please. You're, you're, you're talking about contamination becoming more important at high R sky, right? And I'm just wondering, I'm just looking at this, uh, trying to be objective. And it seems to me you have reasonable evidence here that uh, Mond fails at the smaller scales, but is actually okay uh, at the larger scales, so that there's some sort of scale dependence there, which isn't the one you expect, I understand. But nevertheless, it, you cannot be so categorical uh, in saying that, um, you know, it's preferred by the sort of level of 19 sigma. And that could be reflected in what's happening with the chai results, that you're maybe eliminating those which have higher V tilde, and maybe that's associated with higher high sky. I don't know. Is that possible? Sorry. Uh, well, hang on. Uh, it, it, it is possible, yes. In fact, that's more or less what is going on. However, yes. okay. <laughs> in, in, what I wanted to say regarding this issue um, which I obviously expected, you know, that there would be questions on, is that um, yeah. uh, um, higher B tilde that you get at larger R sky over RM in the Che sample, obviously it's got to be driven by systems which have a larger V tilde, and um, the only way you can make it sort of flat is by removing systems with, with large V tilde, um, right, which is, which is what we've done here. However, the reason we've removed those systems is not to try and get a Newtonian result. The reason we've removed those systems is because they have a high V tilde uncertainty. Um, yes, but I understand this would be uh, in various bits of astronomy. You'd look at this and say, ah, oh, you're introducing a bias in your results because there's a causal connection between the things you declare to be high noise and where they lie on the graph of the, you know, uh, there is a correlation. Um, the reason there's a correlation is because, um, at lower, um, so you can see that on the left panel, actually, um, basically for the same, uh, velocity uncertainty in meters per second, the V tilde uncertainty will be larger at larger R sky. Um, and therefore, um, certainly it is true that there is a causal correlation between the thing we're looking for, which is the broadening of the V tilde distribution. 
or if you like high the proportion of high vital systems and um the acceleration um but um the uh, yeah, about the, 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 th the thing to understand is that the, the reason for us removing the systems with high VTIL uncertainties um, obviously is to try and get the results to be more accurate, right? Um, yeah, but because... I, you could do a modeling of this whole process and try and understand the extent to which you're biasing the results by rejecting on those grounds. Well, uh, the, uh, yes, but what we've done, uh, but hang on, li limiting your sample to very accurate data should not bias the results. No, but it can, it can bias the results mm -hmm. if there is a dependence upon the scale. That's what I'm saying. Of course, there'd have to be a dependence on the scale for what I'm saying to make sense, but maybe that's what's happening. No, there, there is a dependence on the scale. So as I say, the, the, there is no doubt that the V tilde errors are higher, preferentially at larger separations, which is also associated with like yeah. lower accelerations. Um, but um, the way we set it up, right, uh, in terms of sort of quantifying how much the V tilde errors could have affected results. Um, what we did is, um, sorry, uh, yes, so our limit of 0.1 in the most sort of critical range for the wide binary test, that should only broaden the intrinsic dispersion of 0.5 by a very small percentage. What's actually happened, the issues you're saying, you're talking about, Anthony, they actually do arise. But for the sample of Che, where the larger uncertainties, uh, which preferentially arise at larger, wider systems, they actually lead to an inflation of the dispersion in V tilde, and therefore they inflate the median, um, preferentially at low accelerations. Um, but you shouldn't get a scenario where by asking for the data to be very precise, you've managed to introduce a bias. It, it, it happens the other way, where if the data is not very precise and uh, the inaccurate data is preferentially on one end of your scale, that that introduces some kind of trend. But it doesn't happen the other way around, that if your data is accurate throughout, that there's some kind of bias. Okay, I, I could say more on this, but probably better let other people come through now. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Anthony. So we go to uh, Latham. I request uh, the two uh, debaters to please let the other person finish and then uh, respond because as we can see it's a very serious and intense and important discussion and we want both of you or everybody to be able to say their say and so that it we are sat all are satisfied thank you let them go ahead please okay thank you uh yes yeah, so I, I wouldn't i wouldn't characterize myself as a debater here but uh i just wanted to ask a couple clarifying questions um so one is that uh, you know how how good is the so the so you you've given you, you were describing how the relative goodness of fit of the Q mond uh, uh, is 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 worse than the Newtonian fit once you restrict to these small B tilde. Um, how how good is the absolute goodness of fit of the of the Newtonian model? Is it does it give a does it give a good fit on its own in absolute terms or or so, or not? Right. So regarding this question, um, if you just ignore the blue curve and focus on the black curve and the red um, observations, that will answer your question. If you want to judge if that looks reasonable, um, I would say mm -hmm. that it it looks about as reasonable as some of the rotation curves uh, that are used to argue in favor of more. Which often don't fit perfectly either, but. Uh, uh, the, there isn't that much difference between the black curve, which is uh, is actually not exactly Newtonian, so, but it's the best fitting model, which is is very very close to Newtonian. So th this is the best model that our analysis managed to come up with, uh, the the black model, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's not too far off. It it nicely picks up this main peak, the declining tail, and also you can see that there is very few systems here, but in the largest R sky bin, uh, these bins are much more populated. And that is because of the uh, line of sight contamination. If it was just mm -hmm. up to white bars and closed binaries, it would look much the same in all our sky bins. Um, so it, it, the fact that there's a declining tail there, but it's gone flat here and almost started rising again, uh, it's nicely picked all that up. Uh, uh -huh. And of course, it's a bit noisy here with the lower number counts. But I would say that the, in absolute terms, the um, best that our analysis can come up with, the best model, is a pretty good fit to the observations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay. Okay. Um, 
I was also going to ask about uh, the on the plot uh, when you were showing the the, cluster, the data for clusters. Yes. Uh, there were some black points and gray points, and the gray points for the what I, I was just I think I missed the distinction. There, the black points yes. and gray points. What was the difference between them? So uh, you you mean these gray points with error bars? Yeah. So these gray points with error bars are also from clusters, but they involve um, some extrapolation in the gas because basically in the outskirts of galaxy clusters so little gas you can't really detect it but if you assume it follows the same kind of density law that it's following in the regions that you can detect it that's uh, necessary of course to work out the total enclosed mass and therefore the gn and what i have heard is that if you um, are more conservative about the amount of gas because you're not really sure if it's there then that would reduce gn and that would shift the points a little bit to the left um, mm. so perhaps these points would line up even more nicely on the blue track but they wouldn't move much. Um, they would only move a little bit because we see we can see quite low sort of densities of gas. Uh, but yeah, that's essentially the difference that you've had to um, make some educated guesses in order to work out GN. Um, it doesn't that does that that doesn't affect the the y axis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And then, and then, uh, sorry. The, the the final thing I wanted to ask about was in the in the paper. I wanted to understand what you were saying about the paper by Brown and Mutter about the yes. about the solar system. Um, so that that in that paper, I, I I I was under the impression that they were claiming that you know Mond does kind of is consistent with this with the inner solar system, and then does a better job of explaining the the outer solar system phenomena usually attributed to Planet Nine. Were you saying that's that, really what they say, but that's not what the numbers in the paper show. Uh huh. So you're saying that in order for to 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 be consistent with the inner solar system, they have to take such a sharp cutoff function for that free free interpolating function in Mond that it's not compatible with the galaxy. Could you say one more time? It's it, 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 yeah. No, that's to... that's correct. That's that is essentially what uh, what I was saying. So if you check their appendix, uh, then you will mm -hmm. see that uh, it says that the Q two value uh, in Mond. With the latest um, parameters for the A naught and for the galactic external field, uh, assuming the MLS form of the interpreting function, right? I'm on a call. Um, sorry, assuming. Oh, sorry, I, I missed the end of that because sorry, I was just someone was someone was talking. So, so yes. <laughs> the so number, the Q two in there. Yeah. So what I was saying is that the Q two calculated using the latest A naught and the latest galactic external field on the solar neighborhood. Which is pretty mm -hmm. well known by now, but but wasn't necessarily in the past. Um, based on that, uh, this is the Q2 you get for the MLS interpolating function, um, which already has an exponential truncation uh, beyond about 10 a naught. Uh, it, this really cuts down on the difference between new and one. Um, so uh, if you were to, so again, like with the wide binary test, you would essentially have to use a, a sort of a sharper interpreting function, but it wouldn't be sharper in the regime beyond 10 A0 because that's already kind of made as sharp as possible. It would have to be made sharper in for accelerations below 10 A0 or between like mm -hmm. 1 to 10 A0 maybe. And that will then cause a problem with so with um, extra galactic rotation curves. So much like with the wide binary test. Um, so this uh -huh. wasn't really explained in the paper for um, for various reasons. But they. Um, they didn't put it like that, uh, like that. But what what they said is something like um, other interpreting functions can get the Q two down, which is true. But the, what has not been shown, and it, it actually won't happen, by the way, is that it, you can come up with a different interpreting function which gets a much lower Q two, but it also agrees with rotation curves. Uh, you won't be able to do these things simultaneously. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. And and uh, so by by the way, and uh, d does the interpolation function that you need to to get the solar system to work is that also in tension with the wide binary uh, 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 results, or is it is it I more that it's in tension with? There is a detailed study coming up which will look at these things. Uh, uh, in that, uh, yeah, it is possible to argue that uh, any interpreting function which would be compatible with the Q two bound would also like lead to kind of no Mont signal in the wide binaries. Um, it is possible to argue like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you. Thanks here for the interesting thank talk. You, thank you. Thank you. Latham. So, you know, as we know, uh, Xavier Hernandez has also looked at Gaia DR3 wide binary data. 
and uh, he concludes that uh, Newtonian gravitation is breaking down in these systems. And uh, this result is uh, the opposite to what Barnick et al. concludes. So I request Xavier to please share his thoughts on why the two results are so different. Xavier, are you there? I should unmute you, I think. Yeah, uh, please unmute yourself. Right, thanks. Um, yeah. Hello. Well, uh, uh, there are many issues which I think are very problematic with the uh, Bannock paper we've, uh, we've just been discussing. I'll try to be brief and concentrate on two or three of the uh, most serious ones. So, um, Indranil, could you go back to your results in slide 25, please? Uh, um, yes, as, as Anthony Lacenby was mentioning, one is used to having some sort of a eye estimate of what's going on. Now, looking at the error bars that we see here and the, uh, the non-clear situation comparison between the Mond and the Newtonian regime, I think that uh, the claim of a 19 sigma exclusion or preference of one, either the other, is really not borne uh, out by the data, and and I know, and I think I know why. Oh, just before going into that, uh, I'd like to mention that um, in your widest uh, your your widest um, uh, bin from twelve to thirty kilo AU, you are also uh, very uh, prone to uh, um, uh, problems in, in terms of uh, nearby perturbers. Now, looking at your paper just before equation four. You list the uh, exclusion criteria uh, for selecting your binaries, and you mentioned that uh, angular separations, if, if there's any other um, sort of Gaia source within two thirds of the main binary separation, that is removed. However, you leave things which are at two or three or 1.5 times the binary separation. These are fairly uh, um, loosely bound systems. So having a, a perturber, a nearby perturber, within twice this separation, I think is very worrisome. That's why, for example, in my case, I, I end my uh, my samples at 12 kilo AU and make sure that there is absolutely no nearby perturbers within at least an order of magnitude of a separation rather than just two thirds. So I think the uh, the, the last bin here is, is very, uh, is, is very, um, it's very suspect, whilst the others, given the error bars and the uh, similarity between the two models being compared, are absolutely not showing a 19 sigma difference or exclusion of one over the other. And I, and I think I know why. There is something which is very clear in your section two of your paper, which you didn't mention at all. And it is the fact that the errors uh, on, on the V tilde, the observational errors on, on the velocity estimates, on the normalized velocity estimates, play no part in, uh, in the determination of the uh, confidence intervals at the end. Uh, no. You use... You, you you use the errors solely to define the sample but once the sample is defined the errors are are not uh, are not taken as as part of the um, of the uh, of the exactly those those errors do not uh, do not feed into the determination of the uh, of, of the confidence intervals also uh, once you've got your observational template uh, your your binned observational template against which you compare the models it is absolutely standard in astronomy when comparing models to data to blend in observational errors on the models before doing the comparison. Uh, and you fail to do this. You, you do not include observational errors on the models uh, before comparing to the template, to the observational template. You are assuming that uh, once you've got a model, a, mo a set of seven of one of your models, which have seven free parameters, uh, you do not um, you do not dither or 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 blur the, that 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 model before comparing to the templates. Okay, I, I think this is a mistake. Uh, and if you were to do that, I am sure the difference between uh, Mond uh, uh, and uh, Newton uh, would uh, would certainly not be this uh, 19 sigma uh, result, but would probably go down to much less than one sigma. I mean, I think I'm sure I'm sure they would be very comparable if you included observational errors in the uh, uh, in, on the uh, on the models before comparing to the observational template. I, 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 I don't know why this wasn't done. Um, so can now, I answer it, some of these things before? 
Sorry? Can I answer some of these uh, issues? If... Sure. Yeah. So um, regarding the uh, other issue you were talking about regarding the um, the uh, overall goodness of it, uh, yeah, it is sometimes hard to see by eye what is going on. But if you multiplied the li uh, likelihoods of each pixel, it, it would uh, give you an e to the one seventy five preference for the. I, I am sure. I am sure that, that that's um, the case. The problem is right. that the uh, assigning of model pixels onto the observed plane does not include the presence of observational errors. Right, so let me get on to this issue. Um, so I was going to uh, comment a little bit on that. Um, the um, reason why so, yeah, it, that would have, um, we did initially plan to um, sort of uh, denies the um, observed distribution in a certain way to account for the measurement errors. But eventually we, we realized that the guide data was so precise that you could simply restrict your sample to systems where V tilde has a very low uncertainty. Um, and then what would happen is when you do some kind of statistic analysis, which is mainly uh, about reproducing the width of the main peak, um, what would happen is that the main peak's width, which is obviously about 0.5, right? The, that's intrinsic dispersion that will be broadened uh, by, by measurement errors, right? That, that's what measurement errors do, but it will be broadened by only a very, very tiny amount because of um, the uncertainty and VTIL being very small. So what we realize is that if you um, impose an uncertainty limit of 0.1 in the region which is more, most relevant for the wide binary test, so VTIL of 0 to 2, then that would have uh, inflated the intrinsic dispersion from 0.5 up to you know, square root of 0.5 squared plus 0.1 squared, which is um, very little. So it's essentially, the, there are some effects like what you're mentioning, but uh, they should have not affected it very much. They would probably, I mean, if we had tried to include this, yes, it probably would have reduced the statistical significance somewhat. No, somewhat, seems... very significantly. I completely agree with what you're saying regarding the position of the peak. However, your 19 sigma, comes from couch in cells analysis and if you look at your uh, at your very uh, at your error distributions right there you are uh, capping them at point 0.1 uh, your bins in the in the uh, in the sensitive uh, VTL the region oh. have a width of 0.08 one, one minute oh, and then one yes minute. that's right they are narrower uh, you are right. narrower. your bins are narrower than one sigma than your one sigma errors error limit but hang on um wait, oh, wait, the, wait um, go ahead Okay, what I'm saying is that uh, you are capping your errors at more than the width of your bins. So even though this argument regarding the position of the peak and the width of the peak is valid, it is not valid to say that uh, that you have a 19 sigma exclusion of one over the other because... Because systems are really... different. Pixels. Sorry, yeah, uh, I know what the, mean, the, the, the assigning, want to hear, the assigning we want of... To hear uh, both of you. We want to hear both of you. So uh -huh. please repeat and finish. And then yes, uh, I'm, I'm saying that even though uh, Indranil is correct in that the uh, actual width of the peak uh, should not be much affected by the errors he is including, it is incorrect to uh, to claim this 19 sigma result from this counts in cells comparisons because the width of the errors is comparable or or or, or in many cases larger than uh, I mean half to, than half the size of the of the bins. So the assigning of model parameters, model uh, points onto the plane we're seeing on screen right now should have included uh, a certain amount of dithering due to the presence of observational errors. This was not included. So uh, the actual precise numbers of, uh, of counting cells assigned to the models is not comparable to, what, to, to the data that has been used. Sorry, I, I should explain. That is uh, technically correct. That if we, uh, if you observe a system in this pixel, uh, it might actually have been in the neighboring pixel. In uh, some cases, uh, even uh, off by twice, by two bins. Uh, or, or, okay, or, 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 or two pixels off. And obviously, it could be not only in that direction, but in the opposite direction. Um, but um, what I would say there is that uh, the, um, the way that can introduce sort of a, a bias in the results is if there's sort of a a trend whereby you, um, if the underlying distribution is different between the pixels. 
and uh, for that to happen, you need to focus on the actual intrinsic width of the distribution rather than simply the pixelation width. Um, so um, we can go to to trends and and uh, and, uh, and and biases later. But for starters, it is obvious that the nineteen sigma is incompatible with what, what we are showing because so I, I, I agree that uh, it, that could well be lower if you were to include effects like that. Um, if so you want to consider the reality of the, of, of the data you are using, no. Yes. Now, so um, for example, the fact that uh, it might actually have been, for example, one white binary in this pixel, even though we, we've got none. So uh, th things like that, uh, yes, they, they could have affected it. That, that could have increased the statistical significance, perhaps. Um, no, 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 no could, for sure. Okay. Your, your 19 sigma is, 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 a, is, a, is an exaggeration. I mean, I, I haven't done, obviously done the, done the problem myself, so I don't know what the true uh, uh, meaningful uh, uh, confidence limit of, of your results are, but they're certainly not 19 sigma exclusion of, of, of one over the other because of what I just uh, clearly explained. Now, uh, if you go, for example, to this plot you are, you are seeing, uh, you are showing at the moment. Yeah. Th this business of um, of the medium V tilde and, and how, uh, as you said, this is uh, model independent and here you are comparing the medium V tilde at different separations, no? Um, uh, different values of R sky over R mod. In order to for this comparison to be valid and to see if you have a change in in, in the value or not with uh, with with acceleration basically R sky over R mod or with A over A naught or whatever, you really have to make sure that your um, that that the values you are looking at are uh, are meaningful are meaningful of the actual of, of the problem. If you are swamped by noise, if you are swamped by uh, Problems in the uh, in the um, uh, with per uh, perturbers in the white bins uh, by uh, unknown uh, issues of all sorts, closed binaries and so on. This could look flat without it being a reflection of an absence of change of, of a change in gravity. And I find it very worrisome that uh, if you look at your uh, at your um, at your actual results, for example, I think it's a slide um, uh, where you have your uh, your triangle uh, your triangle plot. Yeah. It's like 28. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yes. Okay. Now, um, many of these parameters are wildly off their, uh, their, their independently determined values. For example, the fraction of, uh, of hidden tertiaries that you have of closed binaries is close to 70% or it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's so far above 60%. Was, like 63, yeah. Yeah, 63. Okay, above 60. Whilst we know from um, direct uh, measurements of this quantity that it is below 50%. Indeed, uh, uh, when 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 Kyu Hyung Chai calibrates that fraction in the solid Newtonian regime, he gets he gets a uh, 0.4. So 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 that that number is is, is a little off. Then the gamma fun function, which uh, in your nominal uh, study is uh, around two from the direct studies of Huang, we know that to be below 1.4 actually it's below 1.3 or thereabouts so 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 um so uh, as these numbers are, are a little uh, suspicious for so example, can i just answer the no I, no i haven't finished go ahead uh, your uh, line of sight fraction for example is of a very very small percentage no you have no um isolation cleaning parameters uh, and yet use this line of sight fraction is, is of a very small two percent that is inconsistent also for example with recent uh work by uh Pitoris and sutherland who find uh, a significantly larger line of sight contamination in their binaries of uh, over 20 or 30 percent now uh, uh reading your paper you, you say that you well you're you are not particularly worried by the fact that these independently determined parameters that uh, your best fit uh, values for these independently determined parameters are off, uh, and, and obviously you say uh, you 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 are aware that they're off, and uh, uh, as a, as a, as a way of checking this, you run this constrained gamma model where you constrain gamma to be closer to the inference uh, values, and uh, and you are satisfied in that uh, your alpha graph parameter doesn't change, doesn't depend on on on, on this value of of of, um, of, of, of the 
the, the, the gamma, let's, uh, let, let's, let's first be clear, this gamma um, essentially codes the, uh, w what the uh, distribution of ellipticities is. It tells you how many large ellipticities and how many small ellipticities you have. Now, I, I find it extremely worrisome, not only that this, uh, these best fit parameters are off with, with, with regards to uh, independently direct determinations of them, the, uh, the gamma, the uh, uh, line of sight probability and the uh, and, uh, fraction of hidden tertiaries, but what I find more worrisome is that there is no correlation between your inferred gravity model and these three parameters. At a very fundamental level, we are looking at instantaneous velocities between two point masses. Any particular value of such a relative velocity can be reproduced in an infinite number of ways by combining changes in the mass, which appear uh, when you change the hidden tertiary fraction, changes in the effective value of gravity, or changes in, uh, in, 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 the, in the ellipticity of a system. So in all other uh, white binary studies, um, there is a very clear, there is always a very clear correlation between the inferred value of, of gravity and, uh, for example, the, uh, the ellipticity distribution. Okay. You cannot get away from it. You, you cannot, uh, eliminate a fundamental physical scaling in the problem. You can have the same relative velocity for a combination of different gravity models and different ellipticities. And that is not apparent here. Your, um, your, your gamma contours uh, against alpha graph show no clear uh, correlations. And I think this is a, 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 con a consequence of having ignored the um, uh, observational errors when you compare the models to the data. I think this is a, a, a diagnostic to let us know once you see fundamental physical scalings which are present in the physics, in the problem being treated, being absent, being erased from uh, from the uh, from the final results where we see no such correlations, this is telling you that uh, that, that there is a noise uh, component which has been ignored. Um, so, can I answer some of these? Yeah, sure, sure. There, there are all points, but I think the, the, those are. The, I think I've okay, made. Okay, so um, I'll begin with the last one first. So, regarding the distribution of gamma, um, we had already uh, argued. Um, wait. Uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah, Re regarding the distribution of the gamma um, and the orbital eccentricities, it's already been argued in detail in studies by myself and Pitonis and Sutherland that the uh, distribution of orbital eccentricities has very little effect on the distribution of V tilde. And you can see here the kind of change in the distribution of gamma that would be required to kind of get agreement with Mon. Um, so uh, it, it, certainly the um, very uh, small um, observational errors in the v tilde which might move things one or two pixels um that's not the reason for the bre uh, breaking of the degeneracy evident here the reason the degeneracy is broken here is because alpha graph uh, is basically telling you whether the uh, width of your v tilde distribution is higher at larger separations or at lower separation whereas gamma has a slight effect on the shape of the v tilde distribution but that would be the same at all separations oh, if it were I'm, Newtonian. I'm sorry so about that Yes. I'll answer some of the other concerns now. Um, so uh, now regarding the uh, values of these parameters um, and independent constraints on them. So yes, we, uh, we did of course discuss in some detail in the in the paper about like whether the values inferred for these parameters in cases where independent constraints are available, whether we were more or less in line with them. Uh, the gamma that's been inferred by Huang et al. 2022 um, we argued that, uh, first of all, our analysis is not that far off because you can see there is some overlap between the red distribution and the blue one. Um, but more importantly, um, there is, uh, uh, it's possible that this was, uh, underestimated a little bit because it doesn't assume any closed binaries. And if there were closed binaries, which have an effect of basically randomizing the velocities. That would tend to flatten out the distribution of angle between separation and relative velocity, which would drive gamma closer to one. So if the actual value is slightly above one, it could be that it's even more above one in the real world. Um, so uh, regarding the line of sight contamination, um, Peter Anderson in the 2023 paper uh, argued about how, like, even if you boost the frequency of chance alignments by a factor of 10, chance alignment 
groups are still very rare. Uh, and um, this is different to the uh, so-called flybys, which you're basically treating as uh, not as flybys, but as um, we, we basically have a, a different model for the closed binary companions but, uh, than exactly what they do. But um, certainly the chance alignments of field stars would be quite rare, uh, given the accuracy of the Gaia mission. So what this FLOS is uh, getting is basically not simply chance alignments between field stars, but what we think it's getting is um, for stars that are born in the same star cluster and have a quite low velocity dispersion, they don't disperse too far apart after the star cluster dissolves. And then there's a much higher chance of them appearing along the same line of sight um, and perhaps with a not too dissimilar parallax as well uh, in order to be masquerade as a white binary. Um, so we think this one is reasonable. Now, regarding the FCV, um, obviously the referee did argue with us and, uh, about this and we had to uh, definitely do a lot of work regarding the FCV. Um, which is the likelihood of a star having a closed binary companion. Um, we um, managed to, uh, first of all, one thing to understand is sort of observationally trying to detect closed binaries. It will only get you some sort of, so, sort of a lower limit on the closed binaries, right? Because there could also be closed binaries that your surveys are not detecting. Now, regarding um, this issue, which the referee was indeed unhappy with in the original version of our paper, of our article, with this a uh, high value of FCV because then it was close to 80 percent uh, and that indeed seems very high um, but we were able to get it down without necessarily trying to to do that intentionally but, but what we did is we improved our modeling of the closed binaries the uh, details of what range of closed binary separations we consider um, while still leaving the FCV as a free parameter uh, importantly we all at the suggestion of some of the other authors we also added some a reference to the Ofner et al 2023 paper which uh, tried to account or undo the effects of survey incompleteness and infer the actual prevalence of closed binary companions. And um, based on that, we were able to argue, at least sufficient to satisfy the referee anyway, that the values we get here are, are reasonable. More importantly, I should say that in some of the analysis variants, um, so I think there are these. Yes, in some of the analysis variants where we made some slight changes to the closed binary model, we're able to get down from 63% to maybe 59 or, or 56%. And we argue that with some further slight changes to, for example, instead of assuming a flat one point, flat one dex range for the closed binary A, if you assume like a triangle one dex or something, you might be able, and with some other very slight changes, you might be able to get down to perhaps 50 odd percent closed binary fraction, which is more marginally okay given what the Offner et al. 2023 paper um, said. Um, so the, the closed binary uh, uh, fraction is indeed not as well constrained within its formal uncertainty, because you can see that it's 63 plus minus 1 in this analysis, but in a different analysis, it's like happily 56. So it, it is true. We, we did argue in the paper that uh, the closed binary uh, parameter is not as well constrained within its formal uncertainty. And uh, although this says 63 plus minus one, it could plausibly be perhaps only 50, um, just about. Um, yeah. Now, uh, as, as I was saying, what's more worrisome than the actual value is the lack of a correlation between the inferred value of gravity and but that that's one. Wait, 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 let me finish. Let me finish. Now, uh, when you mentioned that this uh, correlation, this fundamental physical correlation, in the case of the gamma, ellipticity distribution is broken through the uh, analysis of the width of, of the um, of, of the V tilde curve. That yes. is only partially correct. It's only partially correct because your analysis does not focus only on the width, but also on no. the detailed positions. I haven't finished. Yes. Also on the detailed positions. Okay. So, uh, and if, uh, for example, the position of the peak does change with the value of gamma. And if you look at my paper and my most recent uh, paper on the subject, uh, I've got uh, I've got plots of VTLD for different uh, values of this gamma parameter, and a very small change, or, or uh, much smaller than what you are uh, using, produces a change in the position of the peak of the VTLD distribution, larger or comparable to the change in the position of the uh, VTLD uh, uh, of the peak in the VTLD distribution, 
that comes from comparing Newton to Mond. So you can get easily more than a 20% change in the position of the peak without substantial changes in the width uh, by changing the electricity parameter. So this uh, physical, fundamental physical correlation should be there in your results and it's not. And it is not there because of the point I just made regarding the errors being ignored when comparing the models to the data. Now, uh, I have one final point. Uh, I think I don't want to extend myself too much. Uh, just because um, Q Kim Che is not here at the moment, you uh, you showed that um, doing certain uh, quality cuts on the um, on on Chai's uh, on Chai's data, you yeah. can eliminate the uh, what you call an apparent mount signal uh, in his data by uh, by changing this uh, this this uh, this quality cuts. Now, one thing that is obvious from uh, from 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 that uh, exactly from this approach of yours. Uh, maybe the, the the previous one is better, no? Yes, there. Okay. Uh, what is clear here is that there is going to be always a very monotonic um, change in the results, say in the median value of V, with the uh, the 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 quality cut, no? With, with the uh, with, with the allowed uh, level of error that's allowed. Okay. And if you look at uh, Chai's uh, latest uh, paper, the, his, his accept, the accepted version close to be published of, uh, of this paper, he does uh, an exploration. For example, you can easily compare his figure 11, which is his nominal result, to his figure 17, where he has changed the uh, noise allowance by a factor of two and shown that results are perfectly consistent. So there is a substantial change in the allowed uh, um, quality cut uh, of, of of a sample and uh, and zero change in the results. So uh, that, that shows that uh, he's already at the point where, where results have converged in terms of this parameter. He shows that there is no uh, monotonic trend with uh, allowed error and results. And he shows that uh, his, his results are robust to this point. Obviously, uh, what you're doing here is just looking at the median V. He's not just looking at the median V. He's looking at the fully projected uh, uh, distribution, so uh, it, it is it, it is an unfair comparison to 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 take this uh, this uh, this this plot alone and pretend to uh, conclude that uh, child's results are wrong from from this one because what he is measuring is not the median V tilde, okay? And he shows that his results are robust to changes and, and cuts in the in the in the allowed uh, in the allowed error. There are other issues, but I think the main one is this uh, neglect is having neglected the uh, observational errors, blend a blending of the observational errors on the models before doing the comparison. This uh, this makes it obvious that the nineteen sigma claim is uh, is not substantiated by the by the data being presented. I don't know how much lower this uh, nineteen sigma preference preference of um, of Newton over Mond might be. It might be a five sigma result when you do it properly. I don't know. It might be a zero point five sigma result. Who knows? Okay, so can I answer some of these concerns? So I, I'll get on to the eccentricity in a sec. But first of all, uh, oh, I've already shown on this slide that uh, if you um, change the nominal one percent cut on the heliocentric proper motion error that Q had to a point three percent cut, uh, so going from the left panel to the right panel you get almost the same sort of result. It does look like more, um, but that, that doesn't mean it's correct because um, in both cases, the um, variable being targeted is not the right variable to target. What is being targeted with this 1% is not V tilde, it's the heliocentric proportion error of each star. So basically, if a star is moving at maybe 30 kilometers a second, the heliocentric proportion has to be accurate at 300 meters a second which is a lot compared to the relative velocities of white binaries, which typically be two, three 300 meters a second. Uh, so I've already shown here that um, you can get a fake mod-like signal and you can even reproduce Q's claim that changing, uh, tightening this 1% cut to 0.3% preserves the mod signal, which is basically what Q was claiming. Uh, I've already shown that all that can be reproduced, but still applying a tighter quality cut based on the V tilde error removes the signal completely um the other thing i wanted to say is that wait, wait, wait. just just well, no, i mean no. you have to be clear you have to be honest here you have to be clear that 
Q is not measuring V tilde widths. Okay. No. His analysis is much more, uh, he, his claims mon signal is not on the median V tilde. Here you're showing results for what happens when you change this nominal error on the median V tilde. That is not what he is measuring. I understand, but it's a proxy for the strength of any mon defect. Um, I, I agree with what it's you're saying. It's one of the properties. It is it's, one it's of the properties. The position a, of the peak is also important. Uh, yes, I agree. But again, yes. the position of the peak yes. will... All Yes, but the position of the peak will also be inflated by yeah. measurement errors, right? Because obviously yeah. intrinsic dispersion will increase yeah. the... So can I just... Um, address just just, just be, yeah, okay. be very clear here. Q's claims are not on the median value of V tilde, okay? no. which is what you're showing in those plots. I, I agree. But what I was going to say, though, is that uh, re regardless of how what exactly Q is doing, the point is that uh, since you only know the relative velocities of wide binaries, the only way this analysis can work, either explicitly or implicitly, it'll come down to the V tilde parameter. Because all you can know is the relative velocity of the wide binary, and you yeah, can know the Newtonian VC. And, that's, the, and that's, this, I agree. this ratio is proportional to the square root of G over GN. Um, yes, yes, and, yes. Right. The other thing... Can I, sorry, interrupt? So, uh, 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 are you, Xavier, you are saying that Indranin's criticism of J is banked on V median, which it should not be? Exactly. Uh, as we can see here and uh, from uh, from what he said, his criticism on Chai, Chai's paper is ex is grounded exclusively on measures of uh, of median V tilde, whereas uh, Chai does a much more detailed and complicated study. So for, the for thing, example, way to address that is relatively simple. If Chai were to simply impose the um, quality cut on the V tilde uncertainty, um, yes, I suppose so. Uh, by the way, I imposed such a cut myself, uh, yes. and I do extensive Monte Carlo resamplings of the actual uh, data errors to make sure there is no drift and to make sure that my results are consistent uh, regarding the uh, the allowed error. Of course, my sample so, is much more. Could, could I ask uh, just to uh, broaden the perspective? So, Indranil, what would you be? What would your criticism be? of Xavier's claim that Newtonian gravity is breaking down. So we have understood your critique of Che, but Xavier is agreeing with Che, although I imagine, understand... No, but, uh, hang, uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I what understand that uh, Xavier's methods are different from Che. So what is your criticism of Xavier now? No, uh, it's, it's, it's much the same. We explained in the paper that uh, in if you read uh, Xavier's paper, there's some kind of uh, cut on the V the error, but it's set at 0.6 from what I understood. And uh, this is very large. Um, so essentially, my understanding is the same thing. I haven't seen some kind of analysis from uh, Xavier where the V tilde uncertainty is much smaller than the width of the distribution. If that was done, and in that sample, you found some kind of non neutron signal, that would be somewhat more convincing, right? But um, but th this is the problem, right? That uh, the um, Basically, what I was saying is that if you have a 1% cut on the heliocentric proper motion, that corresponds to a v, uh, corresponds to velocity uncertainty perhaps 300 meters a second, which might correspond to VTL uncertainty of more than one like in some, depending on the system. Oh, sorry, sorry, um, but you haven't read my papers carefully. I mean, so it, it, how much uncertainty are you allowing on VTL then? Okay, my, uh, let me see, I'm, I'm looking, I mean, you can look at the, uh, the, uh, I, I don't introduce the uh, the uncertainty directly on VTL. No, but you. In, but there is a statement saying that the. Um, well, let, let me finish. Uh, that, uh, uh, as you know, the errors in the mass and the uh, separation are very small, so they're basically dominated by the errors in the uh, in the uh, in, in, in the proper well in the uh, in, in the actual. I, I don't under, introduce the cuts on the proper motions, but actually in the resulting velocities in the signal to noise of the velocities. Now, and, uh, uh, but you said there was a cut of 1.5 on the signal to noise, uh, which uh, yes, but that's that's the upper cut, and that only removes a few very discordant uh, discordant points. Most of um, if you look at my uh, at my at my paper, but hang on, it's a very small fraction of points can bias analysis, though. Um, yeah, no, that, but wait, that, let me finish. The average, yeah, the average or the mean signal to noise values on the on the relative velocity uh, are between 18 and 8. Okay. No, I understand, but nonetheless, so 1. if you, 5, you're... one point five is, sorry, is, 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 is one one minute, Indranil. Please go let ahead. him. One point five is the upper cut, but uh, most of the uh, of the points have 
substantially higher values of velocity uh, signal to noise, larger than 10 even. Okay. Sorry, if that's the case, then why can't you redo the analysis where the V tilde uncertainty of the fractional percentage error, if you like, on the relative velocity, let's say, if you put it like that. Uh, why can't you do an analysis where the very small fraction of systems where the signal to noise is between 1.5 and 8 are removed? Because according to you, that's like going to lose a very small fraction of your sample. So no, maybe not, not between 1.5 and 8. Between 1.5 and 3, there are very few. I couldn't yeah, but uh, this is what I was saying. Like, uh, if, if you, um, so if uh, that, that's why I was saying there is a problem because if you were to limit your analysis to say systems where the relative velocity is accurate at the 10% level, let's say, then um, instead of imposing a cut on the V tilde, that would be almost the same, let's say. I yeah, believe yeah. that would be too restrictive because basically if the relative velocity is very small, you don't need to have a 10% error on that. You can allow a larger error because the important thing is the error on V tilde. But anyway, leaving that aside, the point is that if you were to do such a cut, but three would be too large because that would imply that the, let's say the V tilde is one, then you're saying if the error in V tilde is 0.35, uh, that's basically okay. That's not good um, because a 0.35 uncertainty added to an intrinsic dispersion of 0.5, if you add it in quadrature, it could still broaden the dispersion quite a bit, and this would preferentially occur at the low acceleration end. Uh, while yes, the I mean, are large. I, I could look at the distribution, and, and as I said, the mean and medium values are are, are of around ten. So no, I, I agree with that. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Please. Um, <laughs> now, uh, as you know, my sample is much much smaller than any of the other samples because I take extreme care to isolate the physics that we're trying to me measure here. Okay, so I have no close binaries, I have no flybys, I have no nearby perturbers, I have only extremely good quality uh, uh, bona fide bone uh, wide binaries. This means that my sample is very small. So um, if I start cutting it more, I I, uh, I basically f uh, end up with no signal. I mean, already in the, um, in the low acceleration region, I have only about 100 wide binaries. Uh, I'd say about 30 of those uh, probably have a, a V tilde uh, signal to noise ratios of um, of, of three or four um, uh, or, or, or larger, no? Uh, I mean, or smaller. Uh, but the greater majority are on the other side. However, I do include follow resamplings of the uh, of the data and Monte Carlo uh, samplings of the data, and I prove that there is no drift. And that there is no um, bias introduced by the errors being used. The, the detailed error structure of the data is used to resample the data hundreds of times and repeat the experiment. And uh, my, uh, my fairly large uh, uncertainty range reflects the, uh, the presence of observational errors at the level which they appear in the data. So I know that my, uh, my sigma errors on the uh, effective value of gravity are, uh, are are real, and they include the fact that some of my data points have uh, signal to noise ratios which are smaller than three or five. They 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 I I, I my resampling uh, fully includes all the details of the data, including the particular sigma of each and every point. Okay, so I think so I I understand. the fact that resampling the data hundreds of times within the uh, error structure present do not lead does not lead to any uh, any drift or any systematic change in the results. Sorry, one thing I would say to this is that if you had your um, let's say uh, the median V tilde was inflated by measurement errors, uh, but this would preferentially occur at the right side of the graph. Um, then uh, resampling the um, observed values would typically inflate the uh, median even further. It's very unlikely that any Monte Carlo resampling of observed values, which includes some random errors, will undo those errors and recover the flat line. In other words, in, in the kind of scenario where the flat line is the latent value, let's say, um, and uh, m measurement errors have inflated the uh, median uh, or the width of the distribution, preferentially at low accelerations, 
it's extremely difficult to spot such a thing by yes he says no I, I agree but you again you again uh you're confounding the issue because neither Q nor me uh, focus on the on, on the mean on the median v tilde we do very no, but there's some measure. analysis of the full distribution of v tilde not just the median so whilst the median will be inflated by errors and not uh, only inflated by errors the position of of, of the peak in the v tilde distribution i, I do a full a Kolmogorov Smirnov uh, comparison of modeled V tilde distributions and observed V tilde distributions. But uh, what I still well, don't I'm get not is sensitive only to the median value. No, and, I, I uh, agree. This is this is just a simplified sort of proxy for whether there is a Mon signal. Well, it, 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 it's it's an invalid proxy. Well, okay, fine. But what, what I was going if, to if, say, if other people are are doing very careful analysis. You cannot just okay, reduce but, the criticism to to a single parameter. What, what I was so going in, to say in, is in, that in, if in you. In, in yeah. an, sorry to interrupt you. So, just a naive question. Suppose you addressed your criticism not to the median but to the dis full distribution. Uh, would you be uh, sort of on the same wavelength as Xavier and Che? Sorry, if I did what? You know, like their criticism is that you are working with B median. Uh, in this graph, yes, not in the main analysis. Yeah, and but uh, your conclusion about troubles with mon are related to use of the median. And no, they're, they're not not really not in the main analysis. This is just affects like what well, this is just a quick way of looking at whether there is a mon signal, which can be applied to my data, but it can also be applied to Che's. Um, That's what they are disagreeing with. That's what they are disagreeing with. Yeah, but yeah? why can it? Not, I mean, I, I'm welcome to plot the data in this way if I want. Um, but what I was going to say is that um, the um, Oh, uh, yeah, I, I, if indeed there are only, okay, I agree that there's perhaps only 100 systems in the low acceleration regime, but first of all, one can relax some of the other criteria associated with trying to remove closed binaries. And secondly, yes, but... if, no, let me just finish quickly. If there were a, a, a hundred systems and, uh, you know, and you're saying that perhaps 30 of them have a V tilde error, which is so large as to be somewhat problematic. Well, then you'll still be left with 70 systems if you remove those. And perhaps if you had a V tilde error below 0.2 instead of 0.1, as I've done, that would probably still be sufficient because basically this argument that I was making here, right, um, relating to the V tilde error. Um, the, uh, yes, no, I agree. I, I, and, and if I do that, I still get a preference, a very clear preference for Mond over Newton, but the, uh, the, um, the, the uncertainty becomes larger. Yeah, it becomes it. larger, sure, but uh, but, but this, this is the um, a relatively simple way to address the issue, right? That uh, if you um, just accept the sample size of dropping from 100 to 70 odd, but the V tilde there, if you put in point two here, for example, uh, obviously the numbers would change, but qualitatively you would get the same sort of result. Right? You have to stop. Um, you have to stop looking just at, at, at the at, at the uh, at the width of the of, of the. Uh, no, but uh, sure, but the, the this is a proxy is for. Yeah, but what I was saying is, if there's some intrinsic distribution and your uncertainty is a significant fraction of the width of the underlying distribution, then your inference on what that distribution actually looks like could be affected. Whereas if your uncertainty is very small compared to the intrinsic width of the distribution, then yeah, um, no, what you're inferring will be... As I say, that's, that's precisely why I test through extensive resampling. Yeah, but how about testing by removing like the 30 so, uh, so yeah, yeah. I've done it as well. And I also get... Uh, 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 a very clear Montian signal, but at a, with, with a with a smaller uh, confidence interval. So I mean, I, no, I, 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 value, but I could increase it. I could increase it, and and uh, and I would still get a Montian signal with a with a lower confidence interval. Now, just one final point uh, yeah. regarding your your issue of okay, relax the assumptions, include more hidden tertiaries. More yeah, because it seems like whatever. the main issue is the V tilde is the random error rather than systematic issues. Yes, yes, I think so. Yes, but anyways, uh, in terms of how important the result is, it, the, the issue is not only the formal uh, sigma of, uh, of of uh, of the method, which, by the way, in your case, is obviously wrong, but also how sure you are of, ha of how you have handled the systematics. That's why I don't want to deal with hidden tertiaries, with the unknown uh, hidden tertiaries, with uh, uh, nearby perturbers, with all this sort of issue, I want to make sure that the binaries I'm using are probing gravity and nothing else. 
They prevent gravity, but the random errors are quite large. And uh, this is uh, the problem because... But the signal is clear, even taking that into account. Uh, you can read my I, paper I, I, and, 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 and be convinced of that. I think uh, th th this, uh, this discussion will be much more informative once you have included the, uh, the effect of, uh, of, of errors in your comparison between the models and the data. Then we can know if your result is a 19 sigma result or a 3 sigma so result. That is likely to drop. But as I was saying, in, that, that is likely to drop. But what I was saying, and though, it's in, certain to drop. Okay. Yes, but so in my. In, 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 in what we are interested in is what will it drop to? Okay. Exactly. But what, what I was saying is, I've hopefully, I've argued pretty carefully why the maximum V tilde error we allow should not have substantially or it should have barely affected like the shape of the v tilde distribution fine right? maybe you still have a preference for newton over mont but this but the statistical uh no it that is certainly going to change i mean i'm sure yes. that will no longer remain a 16 sigma result not. but given the very small uncertainties compared to the intrinsic width of the distribution uh this should be a very small effect um by the way the okay, kind of so let's ask Indranil. Indranil, what's your expectation? 16 sigma will come down to how many sigma? I don't think it will drop below 10. Um, but, I think um, it will drop below to 1. Uh, so okay. I think this is something which we can say, we should be able to sort out with the quantitative analysis. Whether, I mean, uh, you, you can whether in the future. About, whether it's about 10 or below 1, this looks so, unsuitable, isn't so it? In, in what can be done, certainly, for example, this cut can be tightened in, in uh, or loosened um, to get an idea um but um, for example i don't think it, it would uh, hamper analysis if this was 0.15 because this will still be not very different um but um or 0 0.05 then this would be better but the sample size might still remain acceptable for example um but um what i was going to say is concerns regarding the um shifting of uh, uh sort of latent values by measurement errors um, then, um, hopefully, uh, it's clear that these, uh, that obviously is an issue. Um, but that is a much more serious issue for the samples of, uh, what Xavier and what, what uh, Q have been doing, right? Because, um, the shifting of the latent values, uh, due to measurement errors and the impact that has on the V tilde, um, is sort of much more, um, significant, uh, here because you, you can see that it's created such a rising trend when you, you can get it to vanish at, at, at medium v t, at, at the medium v sure okay. um but it's a proxy well, when you look for at like the full distribution things are different and such sure, activities it's, change uh, there, it's, a, it's a proxy there for to, there seems to be a disagreement in the end you are saying it's a proxy so we are just saying it's an invalid proxy. Yeah, but regardless of whether it's a proxy that that's not the point the point is there obviously is very good reason to suppose that um, you need to impose a tight cut on the VTIL uncertainty. Oh, yes, and uh, that is, if yes. that is done, then you we could do have it. a much better... I, mean, I certainly impose a cut on the VTIL error. Yes, and, okay. Uh, uh, but it needs to be smaller than about... Of, of the presence eight, of errors, right? and I fully account for them. No, but uh, hang on. What I was saying is, it, it's. Uh, I, I did see in your paper that there is essentially a cut on the... Well, not quite on the VTL but on the percentage VTL there, should we say? Um, yes, and, exactly. And, signal to noise but, on VTL. I mean, yeah, let's, but, to be perfectly honest, it's it's a it's a it's a signal to noise cut on the absolute velocity in meters per second, but the errors in separation right. of mass are negligible. It, yeah, yeah, so it, which is why it, it's, it, it, you could it, think it, of it as a cut on the percentage error in VTL rather than the absolute. Exactly. Error. But but regardless of that, the point is, uh, I've uh, talked about that in my paper already. Um, the uh, cut is too loose because uh, the the cut is basically at um, it, the the percentage error needs to be like less than sixty five percent, which means yes, if V tilde was say one or, or even point five, then um, the sigma then the uncertainty V tilde could then be point three or, or larger, which is quite a lot. I mean, as, um, as I've already told you, you cannot characterize the whole sample by the by the upper limit. The upper limit is indeed 1.5. Okay, fine. 5, no, I, I but, agree. Uh, but, but the median it, values are of 10, are values of 10. Fine, much but larger. If the, if the, and I already right. told you that if I cut back down to 5 rather than uh, rather than 1.5, 1.5, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I get the same uh, qualitative result, although the uh, signal to noise, uh, I mean, the uh, 
the uh, confidence uh, level of the of the inference uh, drops significantly because I have very so um, right. I see. I so fully control all the system. But hang on, when you say the quality significance drops significantly, like uh, is that like much more than just the sample size uh, square rooted? Um, because it's a little that, more uh, than the, the sample size. So that that yeah. that's suggesting no. that that's actually like removing. Actually, the... I can't remember. I'm so sorry, the, I can't... so I can't that, that's uh, for example. Prices. So, but, uh, what I, I could to, check. Uh, sure. What I was going to say is, like in in this case, for example, uh, it's clear that um, it, the very strong signal you have in in favor of Mond uh, here, um, when you go to the uh, sample you have to here, which is the just... full distribution, not just the width of the. No, peak. I understand. It's not just also the, the position of the peak, and that is not reflected in the. Plot you are looking at. No, the, the the mode is not reflected. Uh, the main reason is that uh, observation modes are somewhat more error prone than the median. Um, but um, what I was going to say, uh, but if you look at the full distribution, perhaps it makes sense. Yes, you have um, to look at the full distribution, uh, which is what a main analysis is doing, right? And, and yes, perhaps exactly. what what Q was doing in his yes. main analysis also. Yes, we're all looking at the full um, distribution, not just right. at the median detail. But what I was going sure. But what I was going to say is that um, here uh, it's obvious that uh, the the signal or the preference for Mond over neutron gravity is is reduced. But this is not merely like a ten percent reduction. Uh, from the reduced sample size, this is like a complete elimination of the same signal. Um, I think, so uh, what I was trying to, to get my, at is... to my, sorry, to my understanding, probably we are not going to make headway on this point. No, but uh, uh, what I was going to say is like it's important to check, like if in in cases like in, in Xavier's analysis or perhaps even in Q's, like um, obviously with these stricter quality cuts on the V tilde error. Um, that would reduce the sample size, and that will probably reduce the significance of any claimed bond effect. But yes, uh, what's important, right? But what's important is whether that's just a straightforward square root of n factor, or whether it's the kind of situ situation which I showed here, where the signal is actually yeah. kind of qualitatively much different. And I, I agree. I haven't checked that, and I, and I should. So th that's that's one thing to to look at. Could you yes, repeat, Xavier? Could you repeat what you said? Uh, I, I say that I agree with what with, with uh, um, Indra just said. Uh, it, it's it's it, one should check that the reduction in the confidence interval uh, when when uh, when cutting the sample size is consistent with the statistical expectations. Uh, yeah. I already check that um, regarding um, changes in, uh, in in the in the numbers. I mean, uh, what I did check. Was that the um, the the change in, uh, in 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 confidence intervals for my inferences in the Newtonian in the solid Newtonian region, which of course is not an Indrenus paper either, and the Mondian region, uh, yeah. the, the change in the error bars uh, in, in between those two regions is consistent with statistical expectations associated to the changes in the in the number of the samples. That I but did check, and that that is confirmed. Uh, I I don't know. If that will also be concerned, uh, co confirmed, if uh, I uh, I reduce the sample to exclude uh, low low signal to noise uh, values, uh, I should check that. I know but that if I reduce the sample to include yeah. uh, only higher signal to noise values, uh, I, I still get the same Newtonian, I mean Mondian region in the low acceleration region, and same uh, Newtonian region in the high acceleration region, with a lower uh, confidence interval. I cannot be sure at this point if uh, what happens when comparing the numbers in the sample I already have, which is that the uh, uh, signal to no well, the uh, the confidence intervals obey or follow expect the statistical uh, uh, scalings. But what uh, about the preferred yeah. value for the gravity in the Mond regime, like uh, your inference on how much that is boosted compared to the Newtonian expectation? It, it doesn't um, change. It doesn't change doesn't if, I, if I throw away uh, the, 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 the the few. Uh, noisy values. Uh, so you're the, always getting about 1.4, 1.5. Yes, yes. Okay. The the uh, confidence but, interval does grow significantly. But it's, uh, I mean, if, mode, if it's a factor of three, no, then, then you, you obviously expect the, the signal to noise to uh, to drop significantly. The, the yeah, confidence interval so, to, to broaden. I, sorry, 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 sorry to interrupt. Could I ask you, Indranil? This yes. was mentioned by Che in his talk last week. That uh, why did you not include uh, the high acceleration Newton, definitely oh. Newtonian binaries of less than 2000 AU. 
they would um, help separate the day the the law right so uh we uh, were thinking about this issue carefully uh regarding the um sky's uh, projected separation range of the sample uh when setting up the plan a priori so as i was saying we fix the um, range of our sky in advance to mitigate the moral hazards right um the um choice of the two kilo au lower limit was based on the um so a fair few systems obviously have uh total masses l slightly larger than the sun's mass so you get up to mod radii of perhaps 10 kilo au for the sun it would be seven um and therefore you have quite a few systems which uh probe down to uh separations of only 0.2 mon radii or even lower um and that means which, which you can see here right um and what that means is that um we're already getting to accelerations of as high as 25 a naught or even higher uh now there is a slight difference very small the way number of cases well Sorry, i mean I like this this whole red bar basically um but um what i was saying is that um uh, we Analysis, our analysis works slightly differently to Q's. Q relies on having a, a subset of this, uh, or having a certain uh, yeah. number of systems, a, a subsample, which is completely Newtonian, and you calibrate the non-gravitational parameters yeah. using that. Um, we are not doing it like that. What we are doing is jointly inferring the non-gravitational parameters along with the gravity law. And for that, we don't require any of our wide binaries to be strictly Newtonian. Um, what we require is instead some range, some significant range in this eta value across the wide binaries in a sample. We're equivalent to require a significant range in R sky over RM, which we have. So be because of this, uh, we are approaching the problem a bit differently. Um, th th yeah, so. Um, yeah, so suppose you read it, everything of, of after including a lot of uh, high acceleration binaries. Uh, this is the criticism that some people are making. So if you bring those in and redo everything, uh, would you don't expect anything to change in your conclusions? Is yeah, I, I don't expect anything to change. And the, the reason is, um, that a, a, although what you're describing can be considered a criticism of perhaps of my analysis, it's not considered a criticism of what uh, he was doing right, um, and uh, in that case, um, the uh, that. no, I understand, but th this to get, uh, get a proxy for whether there is likely to be any kind of a mond like signal or some kind of deviation from a flat line in the region which we're not probing, which is to say, we're not probing the regions between zero and point two, right? Um, because we don't have systems with such low separations, um, and um, given the typical mon radius of the uh, systems in a sample. Now, you can see that in that range, th there is a lot of scatter, but there's basically like no kind of trend. So it, it's not like there is a significant trend in this range, which somehow we're going to find if we include lots of low separation systems. Like even in Q's case, the um, claim signal for, uh, you know, in favor of mon is almost certainly not driven by the systems with uh, our sky by RM below 0.2. It's almost certainly driven by systems with our sky by RM of between four two and um two and a half for example um so uh, basically it's extremely unlike anything special happens in that range moreover the other thing to understand is that even if there is something weird which does happen when our sky by rm is below 0.2 that would by definition be at an acceleration which is higher than the a naught that you infer from galaxy rotation curves so clearly that is not what you're expecting in more no, as a calibrator, as a, as a, as as a, a yeah, but as I say, for the calibration, we are handling it differently because okay. instead of fixing uh, that uh, some of our systems are purely um, Newtonian and using those to do the calibration, uh, what we are doing instead is simply letting the code infer the non gravitational parameters jointly with the gravity law. So, for example, we're not assuming that the systems here are strictly Newtonian. We are actually including the fact that, you know, there is a slight um, difference between the black curve and one. That's kind of already included in our modeling, essentially. Whereas in Q's case, it isn't, uh, right? As in, for the systems which are considered Newtonian, um, there's absolutely no allowance for any kind of deviation due to mon. So he has to, therefore, be at much higher accelerations in order to guarantee that that would be a legitimate approach, right? Mm -hmm. 
So, okay, uh, so here's a concluding comment from Xavier. Neither Q nor I are looking at the median V tilde values. Criticism of our work based on this parameter is pushing a false equivalence. Yeah, but regardless of whether, um, so you might not like plotting median V tilde values, but the point is that we, by looking at the median V tilde values, which should give a proxy for whether there's likely to be a Mond effect, um, what we've managed to do is identify an, um, very serious issue related to the uh, uncertainty on the V tilde parameter. It's very intuitive to understand why the V tilde uncertainty could lead to a fake MON signal, by the way. Um, but, and, um, in and, and, and this, Xavier, you are not agreeing with that a high V tilde uncertainty could give rise to a fake MON signal. Are you disagreeing with this? Um, I, I mean, if you look at only the mean V, the, the mean, uh, the mean value of the V tilde, yes. But if you look at the full distribution, not necessarily. Uh, for example, the uh, the width of the uh, of the distribution is not going to be significantly affected. But hang on, if you, I mean, wait, uh, so I, I mean, I I, I I consider full uh, Kolmogorov Smirnov comparisons of the of the full distributions, and uh, and actually, um, I I, uh, I I include a test. Uh, to this effect in my latest paper what if the errors are off what if Gaia for some reason is showing me uh, uh, um, uh, errors which are actually smaller than than, than reality the real one. what if the errors were larger so I boost the errors and see what happens and yes I do kind of manage to get a slightly higher value for the effective value of gravity not all the way up to the 1.5 me and Q fine but uh, and this is by increasing the errors by a factor of four. By assuming there's an error, there's a there's a, uh, a an offset in the in, in between the reported errors and the true errors by a factor of four. So uh, I can I can go up to something like one point two in in the effective value of g, not one point four or one point five, but yes, one point two. However, the goodness of fit once the uh, full Kolmogorov Smirnov comparisons of the full distributions of V tilde not just focusing on one particular parameter yeah, yeah. or one particular moment of the distribution, but full kolmogorov smirnov comparison of the distribution functions are completely off. And then you can tell that you're, you're making a mistake. You can tell that, uh, that, that the error structure is off by, uh, by seeing how the, uh, the statistical comparison of the distributions degrades. So yes, I agree. You can boost your, your recovered value of, of G by increasing V till the errors. But, uh, but but in my analysis, I fully I fully account for uh, the details of of, uh, of of the observational errors at play, something which is not happening in the paper we're looking at right now. So I, I, I agree, but uh, as, as I was saying, I, I've tried to justify that based on uh, on the vital uncertainties. But what I was saying though is that um, I, I still don't understand this. Like if you have an, a distribution with some intrinsic width. And your errors are significant compared to the intrinsic width of the distribution. Clearly, that so, could bias the results, right? Of course, but they are not. They are not. Oh, that, that, that only happens in a very small fraction of cases. I mean, oh, hang on. When when you say that categorically that they're not, like, wouldn't it be easy to like try and verify that it's it's not by like limiting the V tilde error and yes, showing that? Yes, yes, yes. As I told you, I've done it, and, okay. and the mean results don't change. The, uh, the 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 confidence interval of the results change. Uh, and become significantly larger, not the, the one sigma error bars on the... But the, the mode uh, or the inferred value of G over GN doesn't really change. No, it doesn't. The same happens with Q. He, he's checked changing the, uh, the 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 error limit, not as you say, as I do, uh, as you do and as I do, on, on yeah. the signal to noise on V tilde. He, he yeah. does it on some previous parameter. Uh, uh, he has changed the, um, uh, the, the signal to noise there and, and, and seen that and uh, the, the main results don't change. I've done it as well, and I, I, I and there's no change in the inferred value of uh, of the effective value of G. Uh, what okay, changes so, is given that uh, I have a very small could I, could sample. I, sorry, sorry, where could the signal I to noise values increase. Yes, yeah, so, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think uh, the, if you're okay, I could ask at this stage if the other hmm. people in the audience have any questions or comments. We have. Very grateful to both of you for uh, having, you know, taken part in this discussion. It is yeah. recorded, so it's, it's very valuable. 
people can go back and uh, have a look at the review. We'll thank both of you for this. Any questions or comments? Uh, so we, we have one senior experimentalist here with us, Ashutosh. I'm curious, you have, uh, it's very nice of you to have stayed on for all the two and a half hours. Do you, do you, do, what do you make of it? Yeah, unmute, unmute. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Please unmute. Yes. Okay. So, uh, big caveat, right? For, for you to take anything I say seriously, you should not because what these variables are, in what context uncertainty means, a potential detector effect. Um, I mean, I heard some words that have analogs in particle physics, right? So I'm going to give a bit of a caveat here. You know, is it a symmetric resolution? Potentially, is it an asymmetric resolution? So it can be an asymmetric random resolution. But because it is asymmetric, you know, there's a bias aspect to it. So one has to start, I don't know enough to really help you out. I, all I can say, maybe maybe this is doable as follow-on studies. I mean, I heard in various contexts comments like, there is a way to model something that instead of going to a proxy, maybe some, I mean, we do this all the time, right? For some kind of thing, a proxy is good enough. How do you decide a proxy is good enough? A typical thing is, well, you have to go a little bit beyond to do something more realistic, like some kind of a simulation with some first principles physics put in. You know, in our case, if there's an energy loss, for example, that you have a fundamental explanation of, particles come through your detector and they have some energy loss distribution. And then you look up old papers and you say, oh, energy loss distribution, Bem Strahlung has a calculated spectrum in QED or ionization has the Landau spectrum. And these are all sort of stochastic processes, but they're highly skewed, right? Those distributions are not just symmetric Gaussian like things. Then you put them into a simulation and slowly over years, you build up the simulation. If the intention is every time you learn something will add to the simulation, the next question that comes up, is the proxy good or not? Or what happens if this or that? You steadily, implement exactly the same analysis on the best possible simulation you can get. And then whatever the simulation does, you say, okay, with that additional input or that additional uh, subtlety put in, the simulation now says expect this or expect that. You know, Then you get a sense of if we did this and the detector was like that, or if the detector had this problem, I'm, I'm trying to connect to some of the language I heard, which I can relate to experimental issues or something. Then you steadily start to learn. If this were to happen, you start to build up an intuition and things like this. So at some point, you know, initially pure data analysis, of course, gets done quite a bit in particle physics when it's fine. When you come to an interesting juncture like this, you start saying, okay, how would you resolve it? We will collectively within the collaboration, and sometimes here, you know, you can even work across collaborations and say, let's build up a, a common collective knowledge pool of the Gaia detector or something like this, and a, a dust model, and this model, and that model. And then some of it can be in the public domain, some can be private. And then slowly, the, the entire particle physics community starts to use these tools and says, somebody to fix this, somebody to fix that, it starts to become a better and better model of the experimental apparatus and background processes and whatever else. If this is this interesting, I, all I can suggest is there's a direction here. I have no answers. A direction is start to invest in a somewhat longer term tool of some sort that everybody agrees with that says, you know, we all agree the Gaia detector response is like this, plus or minus some uncertainty on some parameter or something. And then 
when somebody says, if you do this, what will happen? What do you expect to happen on the data? You can have a sort of Monte Carlo exercise done the same way, that if the prior was no mond and you change the analysis this way, the expectation is the answer would change this way. Then the actual data does something similar. So, okay, if it does something different, you say, hmm, what would that mean? So uh, I think I heard maybe how you were saying, you know, you have some simulation ideas and you parameterize distributions and you try to see what the actual you know, satellite up there is doing and if its systematic was like this or if its response was worse than you thought. I think that's the kind of thing we, we, we do. Uh, so maybe my comment is kind of useful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stanley, if you would like to continue, Indranil and Xavier, we are with you. It's up to you. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to say one very brief thing, which which is that, uh, uh, yeah, you, um, the, I, I agree with uh, what Q uh, had written about, um, you know, in his nominal analysis, there was this 1% cut on the heliocentric proper motion error of each star. So, um, and in the appendix, there was some revised variant where this was reduced to 0.5% and even to 0.3% in some, some cases, I think. Um, but that's what we've done here. We've reduced the, um, we've reduced the, uh, we've got the error of 1% and we've got error of 0.3%. In both cases, you see a, a mod signal, right? So it looks like the gray line and it doesn't look flat. In both cases, you can argue that it looks very much like mod. So this hopefully just illustrates how easily one can fool like an underlying Newtonian data set, how easily observers can be fooled into thinking it's mod, right? Because in this, if I just show you this slide without showing you the next slide, this slide would provide sort of compelling evidence in favor of mod, wouldn't it? But then if I just go here, um, if I just go here, now you can see the, the real picture emerge, basically. So I, I think that's um, just what I want to say, that it is possible, obviously, for a for an underlying Milgromian data set to look Newtonian, thanks to some un, unaccounted for bias. But the reverse is also possible and extremely likely, in my opinion, or much more probable, that you would have an underlying Newtonian data set making that look Mondian is, is much more plausible because measured errors tend to inflate the width of the distribution. And we know these measured errors would be preferentially more, more significant at wider separations because the same error in meters per second is a larger error in V tilde, um, which regardless of what exactly your analysis does, is basically what it comes down to. Um, so because uh, not necessarily the median, perhaps the full distribution, but nonetheless it comes down to the V tilde. So because of that, like going from a Newtonian distribution, making it look Milgromian, uh, thanks to some measurement errors, is, is quite plausible. Where, and indeed, it's been, it's been demonstrated just now. But the reverse, where you have a, Mondi, a Milgromian distribution of white binaries, it's really Milgromian, and it looks Newtonian somehow, that I think is, is very hard to justify how that would happen. So that's all I would say. I mean, perhaps it can be done, but uh, it just, it just yeah, seems so very weird for that to happen. The thing, so Xavier is saying, he's right in the chat. That is why Q and I are looking at the full distributions, not just Median V tilde values. No, I, I understand that they're looking at the mean, uh, 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 but uh, so that's fair enough. This median is only a proxy for whether there's a mod signal. Like there's more information containing the full distribution, but nonetheless, this uh, hopefully shows you that it it is quite possible to fool like observers into thinking that an underlying Newtonian population uh, like confirms mod. It's it's not it's quite possible to draw that wrong conclusion, but drawing a wrong conclusion the other way, where the y binaries are actually mondian but somehow you're fooled into thinking it's Newtonian. Uh, I think that is, uh, yeah, it just seems very bizarre to me. How would that happen? I mean, th there's no easy way to see how that would happen. So, Jinder, may, may I come in? Yeah, please. please. I think uh, this might be a suitable moment at which to uh, to call what, you know, in the cinema they call you know, the director's cut. Uh, yes. The, because we have now been talking for close on three hours, uh, but but I would just like to say, um, I mean, one of the things which is a, a complete outside of this field has been brought home to me by the discussion is, is first of all, the immense, the subtle uh, 
methodological intricacies involved in the analysis of <laughs> astrophysical data in, uh, in 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 the context in which one is testing uh, the, the, the rival frameworks such as Mond and the Newtonian gravitation, um, and you know, the, the the immense subtlety, both conceptual and technical, of the of the of the factors involved in this. Um, Clearly, the debate is going to continue. Uh, I, I take also very much to heart, if I could say it, um, just how what a marvellous illustration we've had and what has probably been the most extensive and the most strongly argued exchange uh, we've had in any Q&A session since OSMU seminars began. Uh, the fact that both the principal um, protagonists, both Xavier uh, and Indranil, have remained at all times uh, e extremely collegial and intellectually cogent in their arguments and um, have have clearly both just demonstrated uh, i think very clearly the highest standards of uh, of of the commitment to intellectual cogency and collegiality and integrity and this has been for me an immensely illuminating and helpful exchange as i hope it has been for all the other people listening yeah, thank you. Thank you. Definitely, Michael. I think Ashutosh wants to say something. Uh, sure, of course. One sure. minute. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Thank you. Probably very we'll brief. Um, Indranil, and yeah. maybe advice, you know, address to every comment. Not to come across sort of as, you know, some wise old guy, but as over years of trying to measure something carefully, there are countless examples of us collectively in our field discovering situations where none of our intuitions thought something could happen this way or could happen that way. And we kept saying, there is no way my intuition can be this wrong, that if I do this, then how can that happen? No way. I don't think it can happen. Look, I'm a smart guy. But then somebody says, look, we've tried other things. Uh, let, let's just do a first principles calculation carefully, like a simulation, build it up carefully, make sure that the inputs are put in in an unbiased first principles logic. We agree on what we are putting into the simulation. Then run the analysis blind on the simulation and things happen outside of intuition. So if if I hear too often, I, this is a bit approximate, this is a bit approximate, but but I don't think how I could be fooled by this approximation for the you know salient feature of the conclusion. If there's no other resolution, you really do have to go in, do some first principles thing and check if your intuition was actually right. We've, we've, We've done, you know, I'm sure it's happened to everybody here. It's happened to me, I have to admit it. And you don't want to sort of keep saying forever, it doesn't agree with my intuition, so it can't be so. Can I come in quickly on that point to say, dare I say it, that this brings to mind Aristotle's remark that one is always either on the way to or from first, first sorry, one is always on either on the way to or from first principles uh, in, in any, you know, body of, of of science or any body of knowledge uh, the problem is it's very difficult to tell uh and there are often you know many deeply laid methodological presuppositions concealing from us whether the, the, we are in fact you know on the way to or from first principles in, in, in other words your your point that what for, for, for generations may appear to be you know secure intuitions can can indeed and typically you know frequently have in the history of science been upended completely because methodological presuppositions were concealing hidden conceptual possibilities from us so i mean i think this is this is this is a typical position in the, in the development of science um and it may be that something is it's such as that is at stake here um but it is very striking that as i say the, it, it, it it does seem to me that the the the, the intricacy at which we're able to track the, the, the considerations that are involved in the comparison of the the the, the, the you know the, the the way that we are trying to test um and analyze the data involved in this in the statistical evidence for or against mond or uh, newtonian dynamics um the more the more we go into the intricacies of the involved in 
in this modeling. I, I think the more we, we come back to this, well, the point, in fact, that uh, Ashutosh has just made, um, that, that we should never close our mind to the possibility that uh, um, what appear to be very secure intuitions are, are in fact, concealing you know, deep presuppositions that, in fact, need to be questioned. Yeah, I, I, I agree. So we'll, of course, hear from Xavier early next year, and we invite Indranil to please come for his talk so that we'll have more discussion. And uh, so on that note, Michael, should we wind up? Yeah, or? absolutely. And and uh, once again, I, I really would thank from the bottom of my heart, uh, all well, both Indranil, uh, Xavier, and, and all the other speakers and participants, for, uh, as I say, for the consistent intellectual cogency and courtesy with which they conducted this very far-reaching and, and very very uh, illuminating exchange and um i i hope that it will be a uh, i i hope it will be something which will stand as a very good example of that kind of clarifying exchange uh, once it's up on our youtube channel i hope it gets a lot of views <laughs> yeah yes definitely so, yes. so say goodbye to everyone thank you yes. again and bye -bye. we'll be back next week uh yeah, next to Peter White. Peter White. That's right, yeah. for Peter White. Okay. And then the final week of the entire program, uh, which is Lath uh, is is um Latham Boyle, yes. Latham Boyle on the uh, following Friday. So we end on fifteenth December and we begin around mid February yeah. again. Yeah. And we'll be sending out the list of the uh, first four or five, six months of fixtures. Uh, starting in February, after Tijinder and I have just discussed a, a little further what the order of invitations of people next year will be. But we'll try to have that out to everybody. Um, well, I certainly hope we can have it out before the end of the year. We can, we will, we'll aim for that, yeah. yeah. Send out the program before the end of this year. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much to everybody. Good night. Really thank magnificent you. exchange. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you, Indranil. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. For